is going. Thank you. Okay, perfect. The recording is on. So I want to welcome you to the uh, February 3rd Battery Park City Committee meeting. Um, I am the chair of the committee and my co-chair Kathy Gupta is on the line as well. And we've got Eddie Kay, Jeff Galloway, Tammy Meltzer, um, and we have Mariana James also on, on, who's also a board member, although not on this committee. We are going to start getting going. I want to let, remind everybody who's on the call to have themselves muted while um, speaking because it just has a lot of background noise when there's when you're not muted. And I would also like to say that we're going to go by Robert's rules where I'm going to be calling on people to speak. So raise your hand in the chat under the participants when you want to speak and I will be looking to, to uh, call on you. And I'm going to ask people who are on the committee to speak first. And then I will go to the attendees and I'm going to try to give everybody a chance to speak. So our first agenda item, Lucian, if you want to like put the agenda up just quick. Our first agenda item is going to be um, Alex. And I always want to totally mispronounce your name, Alex. So please pop in and tell me how yeah. to say it. Yep. It's uh, Lucio. Lucio. I should be Italian and I should know, but I don't. Yeah. Alex Lucio, who is the Vice President of, Ad of Asset Management at Brookfield Properties. And he is going to talk to us about the proposed signage for Oval Park, Pump House Park. And I'm going to say that I appreciate your being here, Alex. I know you have a hard stop at 625, which is why we're pushing forward with this right now. And I so appreciate the fact that without even being here last month, you responded and reacted to our concerns raised by the language on the sign that was put up and you took it down. You, you know, you had it taken down and then you're coming to us now to discuss what the language could be going forward. So, you know, kudos to you. That was a really good positive step through community engagement and I appreciate it. And thank you for being here. And I turn the um, discussion to you now. So, Lucian, maybe put up the proposed language because I think we'd want to tweak it and at least give our suggestions to Alex. Christine, let me add that I took a walk the very next day and the signs were down by lunchtime. Yes. I was pretty Thanks. amazed. Yes. Yeah. Really, really quick, really responsive, and I was really pleased. So, okay, so this is what Alex is saying, trying to come up with an idea. Um, I think it may be too wordy, but as a thought, this is exactly what we want. We don't want organized sports. We don't want dog walking. And uh, the rest of it, it should be open, which is fine. So what is everybody, any feedback? Um, Bob, Alex, you first. Give us, you know, if you have nothing to say about it or anything else, let me know. Sure. Well, you know, first, thank you for inviting me and, and you know, for, you know, having this open dialogue, I think that's really helpful. Um, you know, we we want it to be um, friendly, right? We don't want it to be dismissive of anyone. So, you know, look, we're we're completely open to your feedback. We wanted to almost have it give it more of a playful feel, um, you know, and you know, not try and be dismissive of folks that you know have pets and are may maybe looking for someone to walk their dog. So, look, I, I definitely turn it over to to you and and to everyone, uh, you know. Participating tonight, we want to hear your feedback, and you know we're we're open to all ideas. Okay, with that, I am going to see if anybody on the board has some comments about the language they'd like to see there and what they'd like the signage to be. I also am going to note Nick. I think Swadon is on here, and we did have a. Um, oh, I want to say it's a signage, a wayfaring signage committee that was up. And Better Park City Authority had done some great work as to how to have signage that was consistent and attractive, I guess is the right word, whatever whatever the rubrics are and the right adjectives are. They had put together stuff. The committee worked long and hard and uh, came up with some ideas. And that might be a way in which to kind of put things together. But uh, I see Kathy has her hand up. So, Kathy, please. Sure. Um well, thank you. I think it's a great start and, and I like the tone that you're trying to set. Uh, if I had to make two suggestions, one is I would say um, dog play instead of dog walking because people aren't usually walking the dog on the grass. They're playing with the dog and, you know, playing ball. So that's one. Um, is, do is, dog, is dog play a, is that, I'm, I'm sorry, because I don't have a dog. Is, is that a well-known term? Like, if, if we put dog play, will people understand what we're getting at? Because maybe uh, they think that they could just take take their dog 
um, you know, in the park. And I, I almost do we want to keep dogs out of the park? I guess is the question. Yeah, maybe just no dogs, period. But Jeff Galloway, I'm going to ask you to to pipe in with some that answer because yeah, um, I think that um, um, for those of you who don't know, I uh, help run the Battery Park City Dog Association, and I'm a dog owner myself. Um, I, I think, uh, al although there were, certainly would be lots of people who would love to run their dogs around on that grass or any grass for that matter, um, I, I think it's been pretty well understood uh, for many, many years that that is a, you know, dog free uh, piece of grass. Um, and so I think um, uh, if, if you just said dog play, I think you're right people may figure, okay, well, as long as I'm not playing with my dog on the lawn, I can walk my dog across the lawn kind of, kind of thing. And if you don't want, uh, if, if you don't want people walking across uh, the lawn uh, with, with their dog, um, I think you should, it's certainly no dog walk. I'm just looking at the language here. Uh, um, um, Maybe a picture with a dog and a line through it. Like the, I think that's what the Battery Park City Authority has now. I don't know if those are the old signs or the new signs. I Sadly, it's too cold for me to go outside and I haven't been out in a while. <laughs> so I don't remember. Is it meant uh, to be completely dog free? Could yeah, I think so. My understanding is you're not even supposed to, like, I don't walk my dogs inside the grass area of the park. I'll go outside, you know, along by where the district is. If I'm going to go that way, I'm not going to go by the water, but I, I don't take them through the Oval Park area at all. Forget the grass. I don't want to take them on the, on the sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's been historically um, dog free, whether it's been historically enforced all the time. I, I, can, I, I don't know. But since that particular lawn is kind of designed for people to sit on if, they, if they're going to use it, um, I, I think it is appropriate to keep the dogs off the lawn. Uh, although I'm sure some of my fellow dog owners would shoot me for saying that, but um, um, no, but you're but, right. But, but, but I, but but I also think that the I mean I'm not a sign the signage expert I think the language that you have there conveys that it may to the extent that you want um, people to in particular keep dogs off a you know a, a standard no dog sign at the entrance of the lawn or around the lawn or whatever uh, would also be appropriate perhaps in addition to this because we we kind of want to keep this so no, thank you I appreciate it and and. Uh, one of the questions that are is is raised here, at least that comes to my mind, is um, why are we treating this different from any other park within Battery Park City? So the signage should be the same as it, the same as the rest of the parks, right? And I know it's Brookfield sign, but why doesn't it just follow what we're doing for West Thames Park, for example? Although we are allowing much more active play in West Thames Park, but not when I say West Thames Park, I mean the 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 with the fake grass, not the regular grass. So maybe the same signage that's in the West Thames Park where the, where the circle area is along Rector Street, Rector Street Parks, maybe that would be the good signage because that's really basically no dogs and no organized sports. So what's well, well uh, I, I think that fake grass lawn is- Yeah, no, not the fake grass lawn, the other ones, the oh, one in the- Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, not the fake grass, correct. Not the fake grass. Tammy, do you wanna say something? I know you were raising this issue. I think one of my questions will be, and this is directed towards Alex, you cannot ask the public to refrain from organized sports if Brookfield is going to allow the gym that's back inside Brookfield to host organized classes out there, which was also part of the programming. So if you're going to have programming hosted by private organizations within, then I think, you know, using refrain from organized sports is a very difficult thing to ask. And I would say that we, if it's a public park, like all other parks in Battery Park City, because it is owned, then it runs with the same type of um, restrictions and requirements as perhaps Rockefeller, where you know, the dogs can walk on the path because it is a concrete path, but there are no dogs allowed on the grass or in the bushes. And there's no organized sports unless it's permitted. I mean, I'm not talking about kids throwing a ball back and forth. I'm talking about a group wanting to play a soccer game there. That has to be by permit. 
So what's the language then? Because that's interesting. I did not realize that the usage is going to be so if the gym comes out and they'll do like a, a yoga class or a Zumba class on the grass, that's something that's being allowed. So then why couldn't I hire my private uh, or do it myself? Just, just, you know, do a class, my body pump class. I do it out there on the lawn. Why couldn't I do that then? It's not an organized sport. I, but I, work, I, I work. I wasn't aware that uh, any gym was doing programming on the park. Is that something that's happened historically? Absolutely. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, we, <laughs> we attended a class that was out on the lawn that you could register. So, yeah, I know. And that was with Equinox? Yep. Wow. So that, that's why I'm saying you have to be equitable. It's not a pro you can't privatize the park. Um, without saying, and if organized sports need to be permitted, then that's one thing to say, because you can determine and you could make that, you could figure it out any way that you want. But if, you know, Justine is there with her one-on-one -on -one personal trainer doing push-ups or jumping jacks, I see, look, you I, know, I it's a public I, park. I, I wouldn't, look, this is, this was very subjective, but I would imagine if the, that if an individual is there with their trainer and they're you know doing a yoga session it's just two people it, you know it's not disturbing the rest of the park right. i wouldn't classify that as an organized sport personally if there's 10 individuals who you know whether wherever they live whether they work upstairs or whether they live you know across the street and they bring two soccer goals and they start playing a soccer game that takes up the whole park i think that's a different story so it's it's very tricky to you know to try and describe and you know, a small sign, what is an organized sport and what's not. But I don't think, you know, if, again, if there's two people doing yoga class or, you know, to a, you know, a parent and a child throwing a baseball around, I, I don't think that a security guard or a police officer is going to come in and ask them to leave. I, 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 I agree the, with those the, the gist, sentiments. The, the gist, I think the gist of this is to really prevent you know, a, a rugby game from breaking out with 12 people or, um, you know, someone walking their, you know, dog in or, you know, taking a Frisbee and playing a Frisbee with a dog. I think those are the two things we're trying to keep out, to keep the park safe. Um, I'll have to look into the, the Equinox programming. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, let me look into it because I thought typically all of that programming happened more on the plaza, the Brook, you know, the Brookfield Place Plaza. Um, fronting North Cove, I wasn't aware that it, it was in this park. But that being said, again, I don't think anyone's going to stop someone from doing a yoga class with two or even three people. I wouldn't consider that. I think this is more of, you know, someone d doing a baseball game or a rugby match. That I would agree with. Um, so and, how do we? I would also just that. add that I, I don't think we should overthink this either. I mean, the, right. there, there is something to be said for relative simplicity and i'm not a signage expert uh and i wasn't involved in the wayfinding project on battery park city generally so I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other whether there should be consistency with this particular park but i, I certainly agree with the sentiment and the tone uh, and and the content uh, of the proposed language if that message could be conveyed in a different way, I don't have any problem with that, but I also don't think that we need to, you know, really overthink the whole thing and, and try to deal with every conceivable contingency. Yeah, I agree, because people will be policed by the Brookfield people, they'll be policed by other residents, they'll be policed by history of what was going on there, too. People will have some sort of historical knowledge of what's allowed. Um, I do right. think that's kind of what my point was, is to ensure that, you know, if people are playing in the park, they're not going to be, you know, kids are kicking a ball without anybody else around. They're not going to be kicked out of the park by Brookfield security because that's not cool. And right, that's, right. that's, you know, exactly the only point that I'm trying to bring up here. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. It is a public park. So how do we accomplish that, though? Because I agree with that sentence. And I also see Betty has her hand up. So let's let Betty say something and then think about if we can give Alex some clear cut d direction and then just let him go and come back to us with a kind of a draft of a sign, you know, with an informal draft of a sign. Well, 
actually, Justine, you've just mentioned what I was going to recommend, and that is it goes back to Brookfield to put together what they really want. Um, I agree consistency with the other parks would be valuable. Uh, I can tell you, since I look down on Rockefeller Park, uh, it is a group of martial arts a class that completely trashed the lawn. I mean, completely trashed it. It was all dirt, and it happened over a fairly short period of time. So I do forewarn those at Brookfield that it can happen quite quickly and it occurs with the classes that didn't exist pre-pandemic. They would do their indoor thing, but it is a real consideration and they are not organized sports. They are groups taking lessons mm -hmm. that are doing activities. So making a dog free would be an easy way of for words for that because mm -hmm. I really dog play and stuff. Yeah, standardized words, I would look at sign experts and kind of what they're doing in the other parks so, to be consistent. So unfortunately, I need to go in a few minutes, but yeah. what I would say is what we what we presented here tonight is what we would like to put up there. So to the extent that there's something in here that you don't uh, care for or like to change, I would actually ask, um, you know, this subcommittee to come back to Brookfield with a new draft because you know, we've spent a lot of time on this and we and we this is something that we feel good about this sign um, as drafted. So if there's anything that you want to change, again, we're all ears. We want to do this collaboratively, but I don't think I've heard enough here tonight to be able to go back to our team and to come up with new language because I, I don't think it, you, know, you, you can't come up with every situation on a, on a very yeah. small sign. That I, would, I do have one language. Did we see that? Sorry, this is what we've seen. Yes, what's on the screen right now? Well, there, there is one point we didn't discuss. If we're sending dog owners someplace with their pets, there's a dog run. Yeah. The other side of the Liberty Street ramp, you know, which has everything they would want: water, companionship, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, I don't know if I guess part of what I dislike about this sign, which I would agree with Kathy, is I don't know that you need to tell them where to put your pet. I, I would just maybe I, I would leave this so why, don't delete, delete the, why don't we delete the last sentence? Yeah, the last, two sentences. Us, last two sentences, get rid of it. And then please help us keep the park safe. Um, no dogs. How about how about keep the park safe and dog free? So hold on, Justine, I have a question because dogs have always been permitted in the maze area, just not on the oval lawn. And even on the Battery Park City canine ambassador promotions that the authority has put out, it says we permit all on all hard surfaces except those designated as public art, such as South Cove and the Irish Hunger Memorial, that dogs are permitted on hard surfaces. They're not permitted on green spaces, including planting tree pits, planter beds, lawns, and lawn-like surfaces including ball fields and West Thames lawn. That's correct. So, so help, please help those, us keep those are the things, you know, it, you could very easily say dogs are not permitted in planted areas. <laughs> period. Yeah. Help us keep the park safe and refrain from organized park sports, period. Dogs are not permitted in planted or grassy areas. Send it. I mean, Lucian, can you type that? I would, I would type it if I would, and then we can just send it to Alex later because he's got three minutes and he's out. I think I think I have it. Please you help have us it? keep the park safe. Please help us keep the park safe and refrain from playing organized, organized sports. Correct. Playing organized sports. sports. Dogs are not permitted in planted and grassy areas. Be perfect. Alex, right. do you mind if I look up the Battery Park City Authority terminology on what they consider active play? Because there's a, if it is, you know, the only qualification I believe that the Battery Park City Authority has made in other parks is active versus non active play for consistent pass, passive recreation. So how about, how about this? Term we're using. Why don't we do this? How about, how about we, how about we even take it a step further? Please help us keep the park safe and ref, ref, refrain, refrain from active play organized sports. Or classes. Does that, does that work? Um, you know, I, I, we're kind of going in circles. See, yeah. Active okay. play would Could include be, yeah. a kid throwing a ball back and forth, which, which by the right. way, is okay. not permitted on some of the lawn. When the you know, Battery Park City lawn says no active play, they don't, really they don't allow it. kids to throw a little ball back and forth. Yeah. And so okay. th th this is kind of a unique park that's actually 
different than the passive uh, mm -hmm. lawns in Battery Park City. Because um, the little I, kids have been allowed to yeah. do that. And the little yeah. kids have been I mean, allowed to run. I mean, like, I know the kids, my kids used to play crazy, you know, tag and all that. Again, when it was just them on the grass. So I, I go back to I, I, the, the, the I language like the, there is actually pretty good. Get rid of yeah. that sentence. Um, and I don't think we need to overthink what is active and not active. Um, so, yeah. Okay. If problems we'll of use from, from, comes up, we can deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Refrain from organized sports, which then just sounds more elevated. And then we can take that up and see how many people are actually, you know, in the time of COVID, I don't know that I mind so much that people are out there doing classes on the grass. I'm sorry, they're ruining some grasses, but I don't mind it because where are they supposed to go? But once COVID's done and we can actually go back inside, then we can revisit it and, and sort of say, hey, guys, go back inside. This is, you know, you've got a place for this. But um, I like this and then just say no dog, you know, whatever we whatever we said, the language. Um, yep, yep. It's a dog free zone, not on the grass or planted areas. And I think that settles it. And it's 27 and you may go, Alex. Thank you. Are we good? I don't know if anybody in the attendees has an road raised. I will let them speak to us, but Alex, thank you. Okay, take care, everyone. Be well. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye bye. All right, I'm looking now for attendees. It just takes me a minute to make it open. More attendees. Yeah, I don't think anybody had a hand raised in the attendees about this topic, so I think we're good. All right. So, thank you. Um, Lucian, if you're there, would you put up the agenda again? Certainly. Thank you. Tammy and Betty, take your hands down unless you're really raised. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So, extension of the CARES Act. Mariama, unmute yourself. We decided after talking with um, Pat that we were going to push this discussion and resolution to the um, Quality of Life Committee at the end of the month, the 16th or the 18th, whatever it is. Is that a correct statement? Yes, that is a correct statement. Okay. Um, I did get contacted by a couple of people who wanted to make some comments related to this and they wanted to they asked if they could have like a minute each to speak and i said since we're cutting this out and i had allocated 30 minutes to it i would allow i believe it was three people to make a short statement so i believe they're in the intended that makes sense to me that makes sense I'm right what they have to say sure yeah i mean i think it's fair um i'm glad you're here to represent i'm also on the i'm also on the quality of life committee bob i think you are too I'm not sure. Betty, are yes. you? So we've got some members who are members of both committees here. Um, so there's some representation. And um, so, yes, there's that. And I, and I don't want people to feel like they can't speak. So um, I know, I think Sydney, is it Sid, Sydney Artston was here. She's got a time commitment. She, I know her hand's not raised, but if you can unmute her. And then um, anybody else in here who's going to speak, I'm not sure, raise your hand. So I know. So Sydney's raised, Roseanne Perry is raised, and I'm not sure if there was one other person, but you got a minute. So if we can, Sydney, I think you're unmuted. I'm unmuted. Go ahead, please make your statement, and I appreciate your um, coming in and, and speaking, and you know, identify yourself and say hello. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Sydney Artson. I'm a law student and part of the local group, Battery Park City for Black Lives Matter. I wanted to make a brief statement regarding uh, the NYPD response to uh, recent protests. New York communities must redefine public safety and protect those targeted by surveillance, policing, and punishment. Poor people and people of color disproportionately face the people's, the police's fear-inducing and discretionary practices. We urge Manhattan Community Board 1 to submit a statement opposing police brutality and the racist nature of this institution and committing MCB 1 to keeping its people safe. From the murder of George Floyd to the storming of the Capitol, myriad incidences reveal how law enforcement remains prejudiced and unfettered. As New York City responded to the structural racism of law enforcement, police officers met some of these demonstrations with excessive and violent tactics. The New York City Department of Investigation report assesses NYPD's systematic response to police to protests from May through June, hereafter Floyd protests. The findings on NYPD strategies, training, and policy community relations include that NYPD 
lacked a clearly defined strategy tailored to such protests, heightened tensions with crowd control tactics and excessive enforcement, deployed insufficiently trained officers, and lacked a centralized community affairs strategy. The DOI report states some police officers engaged in actions that were at a minimum unprofessional and at worst unjustified excessive force or abuse of authority. But the problems went beyond poor judgment or misconduct by some individual officers. The department was suppressing rather than facilitating lawful First Amendment assembly and expression. Mass arrests and volatile confrontations traumatized protesters who are reacting to those very displays of unjustified and unchecked power. While New Yorkers demanded attention and change to issues of police brutality through their constitutionally protected rights, police replicated the very violence that spawned their public outrage and fear. The NYPD's systematic response to lawful protests and the enduring police brutality throughout the country confirms that police pres presence makes communities less safe. MCB1 should ensure that its constituents may live without fear and assemble in peace by one, formally condemning police brutality, two, publicizing alternatives to calling the police, three, resisting police intervention and presence at protests in its neighborhoods, and four, demanding that if police must be present at demonstrations in the area, the officer's responsibility is to abstain from physical force or arrest, to support the people's First Amendment right to assemble, and to protect the people. MCB1 must be a proponent of public safety by and for the people by blo blocking discriminatory and unsafe practices of the NYPD. Thank you. Sorry, I was, I was muted and talking. Thank you so much, Sydney. I appreciate your comments and, and um, yeah, very important, I think. Um, I'm gonna let, I guess, Roseanne speak next and then Mar Mariama, can I, can I let, well, I'll let you speak because you're on the board. So Mariama, okay. go ahead and speak. Well, I just wanted to quickly say that I, I thought your statement was amazing. Yes. And I think that it's really phenomenal um, timing that Hannah Wienerman, I, I think it's like by happenstance that she's there. I, I, I don't know if there's another me reason, but our Congressman is a co-sponsor of the, um, the federal racism and in, in public scenarios act. I, I forget the exact public scenarios or public safety the, the act. public spaces of 2020 act. She can correct me um, as, as to the name, but it is sponsored by um, Congresswomen Lee and Presley and uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. And it is something that, you know, we've, we've brought to the board and we've talked about in quality of life that, you know, that Hannah has um, worked with us on. And so this, I think this is totally related because one of the things that the act seeks to do is to establish sort of like a monitoring, a federal monitoring um, of, of the systemic cases and incidents, uh, uh, you know, of, of racism and to really um, begin to, uh, you know, undo, um, to unravel to the extent that, that that's a possibility from the inside of these agencies, you know, the, the, the you know, from the root, this systemic racism. So I think it's just great. You know, Thank I, you for allowing them to make these, these statements or for allowing um, Sydney to make that statement. You know, I appreciate it because a lot of that activity, not a lot, but some of that activity did happen here in Battery Park City. So it's important that that's acknowledged that, you know, in Lower Manhattan, the, we, we had protests in Lower Manhattan. We saw the police overreacting and um, sorry for my own eyes, I would say attacking the protesters. Um, so everything that Sydney said was spot on. And um, yeah, it, it's a conversation for the Quality of Life Committee. I understand that, but I also think it's an important thing to acknowledge in Battery Park City because it happened here. Um, thanks, thanks, Sydney. Um, Roseanne, go ahead. Um, Lucian, you have to unmute her. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to sort of thank you very much, Sydney, for that, and I wanted to add a little something for the same line. I am a resident of Battery Park City, and I regard my community with affection and connection, and my community board with respect and admiration. For me, it's imperative that the MCB1 
takes a stand on critical social and political issues that best reflect the core values and standards of our community. Accordingly, I am confident MCB1 will issue a bold statement of unwavering opposition to police brutality and strong defense of the safety and well being of its citizenry. It is my hope that MCB1 will demonstrate their commitment to the well being of all its residents. MCB1 must formally acknowledge a thorough review of the New York City Department of Investigation report assessing the NYPD's responses to the city's large public outpouring of grief and outrage for the brutal murder, public murder, of Mr. George Floyd, a naval policeman in Minneapolis on May 25th, 2020. Millions of people across the world in one huge global gasp of revulsion and horror marched to demonstrate the condemnation of the richest power of systemic racism to honor the memory of George Floyd. It was made clear that human beings were crying out into the darkness that we are better than this. We cannot abide by such cruelty and injustice. Underlying the outrage was the collective knowledge that while we witnessed George Floyd's murder, we seldom see what happened to the untold thousands of other victims of racial hatred and violence at the hands of the hired representatives of a very unjust justice system. We had hoped that our city would join in the public mourning by protecting the thousands of citizens in the streets and clearing the way for them. Instead, we watched the NYPD attack and abuse and arrest nonviolent protesters. And yes, we all need to understand that loud, angry voices and clenched fists do not constitute violence. A protester who's screaming and crying is not a violent protester. It needs to be violently attacked. The DOI report declared that the department was suppressing rather than facilitating lawful First Amendment assembly and expression. The report cites in detail use of excessive force and the abuse of authority. It would be an exercise in public safety and community development for MCB1 to condemn police brutality and engage in a public conversation about alternatives to policing as we know it. As a community, we must demand that the NYPD respond to the list of offenses cited in the report and put together an immediate plan to enlist new strategies to protect and support their citizens. Racist behavior must be uprooted and racist police officers fired. Anti-racist training among all members of the NYPD should be mandatory and well-documented. As a community, we must demand full transparency from the NYPD and a fully integrated community approach to enhancing public safety and maintaining law and order. That's it. Thank That's you. it, Roseanne, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to let you finish. Um, again, this is something for the Quality of Life Committee to be taking up to have the discussion at, so I'm not gonna have a discussion here, but I appreciate you coming forward as a Battery Park City resident. And, and expressing your opinion and speaking your mind, because I think it's important and I think it does matter. And all these issues matter for every committee, whether it's licensing or anything else, it matters for every committee in every community board, because as we've learned, I think this passed in Congress that uh, uh, racism is a public health crisis or, or whatever, I, I believe that passed, this was passed, at least it was presented today. So anyhow, enough with this topic, let us move on to a more, um, local issue, which is the, oh, and so uh, again, to talk about the CARES Act in relation to condominiums and cooperatives, it's it's all of Lower Manhattan, not just Battery Park City or the Battery Park City Authority, that conversation and that resolution and discussion will be taken up um, at the February 18th, I believe, quality of life meeting. And hopefully the, the comments and conversations that has been raised by Sydney and um, Roseanne will also be addressed. Um, okay, we are now going to go move on to the uh, Esplanade Pedestrian Management Plan for the proposed citywide ferry service to Battery Park City discussion and possible resolution. So I think on the line, Lucian, we have um, some folks from EDC. Yeah, yeah. we have Raddy Miranda with us. And 
Uh, I'm moving Roddy, Roddy over. Roddy, you also have a, a, a co-worker, a colleague. That yes, is, Franny Civitano is here with us Franny as well. Franny Civitano, okay, I'm going to move Franny over, over as well. And Roddy, I'll be giving you the uh, presentation privileges. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep, yep, yep. See, so you know, while while I get the permissions and I'm able to share the screen, just want to first thank you all for having us again. I know it's been, I guess, just about a year since we've last connected. You know, I, we were able to be with this committee back in February of last year, and then of course we still had an opportunity to go through our environmental review process and host our meeting um, in the in the community, like the first week of March before you know the world kind of went in a different direction. But wanted to come back and make sure that we are able to provide you with the latest and greatest information um, and, and give you a status update on where we are. Um, with that, I'll pause and just introduce myself. My name is Raddy Miranda. I am with the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And my role here is government and community relations. And I also have um, Franny uh, Civitano from the Fair here who can introduce herself and her role. Hi, everyone. Um, um, uh, my name is Franny Sotano. I'm the NYC Ferry Deputy Director for EDC. Um, I also um, have experience working with Hornblower um, for the first two years of operation. I was the Director of uh, Rider Services, so I focused on queuing and customer service and things like that. So just to say, <clears throat> I know that that is a, a topic of, of conversation and concern, and um, this is sort of my background. And um, while we don't have um, our queuing plan finalized yet, and we are looking forward to hearing uh, your input and, and specifics on concern, um, we are looking to um, taking on that as we develop the plan and finalize that. Okay, great. So with that, let me the presentation. I will start with uh, a brief overview of the system for those of you that may not remember. I know it's, there's been a lot that has happened over the last year. Um, but NYC Ferry, as you all, uh, most, most of you should know or would know, um, we have five routes that are currently in operation, particularly in your district um, and Wall Street. All of the routes um, currently uh, service that area in our that is um, our biggest hub, right? So um, a lot of you are very familiar with the service. It is seven days a week, year round, typically from about 6 a.m. to 10.30, 10 p.m., 10.30 p.m., depending on, on the route and how far it is from the landings, honestly. And it is about, it is, the fare cost is $2.75. And there are a couple of ways to get your tickets. Um, you can buy your ticket at the landing. We'll talk a little bit about that. You can buy your ticket via the app. And we actually just started um, today um, contactless um, ticket scanning, um, which I know Franny has been working on for a little while too. So um, it makes things uh, more efficient for us. Um, it's able to help us with more planning and information. Um, and also now during um, COVID, of course, it is a, it has the added um, health benefit. So with that, I'll continue. Um, what we are looking at in this screen, are you able to see my cursor as well? No, great. Okay, so the what we are looking at today is the St. George route, which is what is being, uh, what is the route that is being. Ex I'm sorry, I'm like all over the place today. <laughs> um, uh, it's the one that's being expanded. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. The expansion consists of two routes and an and an added um, landing. So it is the St. George route, which goes from St. George um, in Staten Island over to Battery Park City, and then continues up to Midtown at West 39th Street. Um, we are also um, expanding over in Coney Island, um, which will go to Bay Ridge and then Wall Street. And then we have one more route um, expansion, which is the Soundview route going over to Throck's Neck. Um, those are not necessarily um, the topic of conversation today, but it is important for you all to know since you have the option of walking over to Wall Street and getting on any of these routes. Um, this um, expansion we have here um, is 18 minutes to get um, over to St. George um, or 17 minutes to get up to Midtown. Uh, the route itself in total um, from front to end is 35 minutes. Or it's approximately th 35 minutes uh, during peak hours. That means, you know, when folks are mostly going to and from work, uh, we have vessels, vessels that will be coming around every 25 minutes or so. And then off peak just varies um, based on whether it's a weekend or 
um, all, or um, winter, um, it'll vary um, and can go anywhere from uh, 45 minutes to sometimes an hour and a half, right? Depending on, on what is appropriate to meet service demands. Um, with that, um, I will continue to the next slide. I know um, one of the things when we came over to this community board last year was a lot of concerns around the path um, construction and the tunnel construction and the frequency of other vessels that were coming. And I know one of the things that we heard loud and clear was, you know, this this NYC ferry service sounds like it'll uh, be helpful. Um, it's just right now we have a lot of a lot of added traffic that is not typically here. Um, that has then changed, <laughs> but um, just wanted to make sure that that I do um, highlight that. I know that was a particular concern because having all of this launch at the same time would have been um, pretty chaotic for the community. Um, I'm, I can't hear you, Sim, but I, it looks like you are speaking. No, yeah, no, I'm just shaking my head. I'm laughing. Um, I think that what was said was we appreciate you waiting till after the uh, path train was opened because it was kind of overwhelming. But I don't think you heard anybody ever say, well, maybe one or two people out of multitudes say that stopping at Battery Park City for this new ferry was something that we wanted or we thought was was um, needed, especially with the Staten Island ferry that's free. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. That's what I was shaking my head. I'm, but I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm interrupting you, so please go on. Completely understood. All right, so I will continue from there. Uh, we are we have a couple of more slides that we just want to get through. Um, so just in terms of timing, um, right now we are doing some of the construction on the St. George end uh, and doing some power driving there. That should be pretty much wrapping up um, late spring, early summer. Um, you know, uh, simultaneously we are going to be working on installing the ticketing machine, the digital information displays um, at Battery Park City specifically, uh, and working, Franny specifically, who's going to talk about it um, briefly, but working on queuing and what that means for the astronaut and slip assignments and signage um, at the landing to make sure that all operations flow um, efficiently and we have as least disruption to um, daily activities there. And right now, uh, what we are committed to doing is launching this route this summer. So let me continue from there. And then from there, I'll pause and give it over to Frank. Great. Um, so yes, everyone is aware um, that we are planning to uh, connect this route to Battery Park City. Um, we are aware that there are concerns. Um, the path concern was one of them. COVID <clears throat> was very helpful with that concern. Um, but we know that they there are still concerns that exist, and one of them is queuing. Um, I know that this um, the you know the agenda item for today was to talk about the queuing. Um, we don't have our queuing plan settled yet. I think we we wanted uh, a chance to get on the ground and do some site visits, and also um, get the specifics of the concern. I know that there's concerns about um, the Esplanade um, and not. <clears throat> taking up the whole esplanade with lines. So I really want to make sure that I can take those things back to our operator so that we keep those in mind as we are um, working with New York Waterway, who manages the pier and, um, you know, coming up with plans with Hornblower, the NYC ferry operator, um, to make sure that we are uh, trying to keep all of this in a place that will um, efficiently serve the ferry system um, and also, you know, not cause a, a, a huge problem for um, the Esplanade users. Um, <clears throat> so that's really what I, um, I know that the, the focus here, you know, you all wanted to be on um, queuing. And so I, I would love to open it up to people um, you know, to talk about that, but we don't have a, a specific plan yet that we can present. Okay, part of part of what um, I'm disappointed in is that you don't have a specific plan yet, or at least some perimeters parameters for a plan, because this is a huge um, problem for us in Battery Park City, especially in the North Battery Park City, and in my North neighbors here on the committee, as well as the North neighbors who are on the chat as attendees are going to speak up and express themselves. But the issues that I'm aware of is that number one, the nightmare scenario that um, the Staten Island, I'm sorry, not the Staten Island Ferry, the uh, Park City Liberty Ferry and, and 
the number of tourists that are down by Battery Park, that scenario is horrifying, and we do not want that replicated in Battery Park City. Now, the other side of the coin is, I honestly think that this is a complete and absolute waste of money to stop at Battery Park City because we have the Staten Island Ferry that's free. And maybe you've got people who want to come from St. George's and get to Midtown. That might be a reasonable uh, choice for them. But to come to Battery Park City, why in God's name would you spend 275 or five, whatever, five, six dollars a day round trip when you can get back and forth for free? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so there's that. But the other side of the coin, too, that I'm hoping um, I'm going to hear from people who actually are experiencing it in real time, the noise pollution. And the exhaust pollution in the water. Um, why are we not having, um, well, actually, tell me this, what kind of boats or ships, whatever they're going to call ferries, are going to be used? Are we going to finally be at? Uh, yeah, thanks, Raddy. <clears throat> so this next slide is, is about our fleet. Um, we have two different size vessels, 130, or sorry, 150 passenger vessels and uh, 350 passenger vessels. Um, you know, pre COVID when we were mapping out ridership and plan and estimating ridership for this route, um, we have planned on the, the larger vessels for this route. Um, but both are catamaran designs, so they're meant, um, you know, to move, uh, you know, to be efficient. Um, they're not going to be as slow as the Staten Island Ferry. And I think that's one of the benefits of NYC Ferry for people who are, um, you know, getting to the west side is that it's it's much faster than the Staten Island Ferry. Um, but all of our vessels um, have a minimum of a tier three requirement, which at the time when we were building them was the highest standard uh, engine, uh, EPA rated engine that you could build. And when the EPA upgraded their, um, you know, uh, vessel, designs for for what could be uh, a better rated engine tier four we introduced those we have the first two passenger ferries um in new york harbor with those engines so those have an even lower nox emission um obviously that's not our whole fleet but uh they are built you know the uh they're still they're they still use gas to operate <clears throat> um but they're the highest rated vessels um, that we had at the time that we were building them. Um, and then as far as noise go, because I, I, I also used to work for New York Waterway and I know that noise is a considerable concern for this community as well. Um, you know, for those who haven't been able to hear the, uh, the horns on the ferries, um, they do, they're they're quieter. Um, and when we launched NYC Ferry, um, we did not have these quieter horns. Um, and I remember the first month of service, the the folks from North Williamsburg, especially who have buildings that are right up against the water, um, were calling us and emailing us nonstop for the first month. And then after we introduced these new horns, we haven't heard anything about horns. Um, in the last four years. So uh, I, I can't say much more apart from that and that, you know, I invite anyone to, to go out and listen to them, but, um, you know, that, that's what we've done with the noise. Interesting. I seem to recall meetings in which we've had issues and discussions about the noise. I remember sitting specifically in, uh, oh my God, what is it, six? Six River Terrace, where we'd sit there and actually hear the horns beeping in the middles of our meetings, and mm. then, and how some kids would be, some parents would say that their kids would just their first words were beep 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 because that's all they would hear the horn. Correct. Beep. Correct. Just to to be to be clear, um, Justine, the, the horns that you were hearing at that time were not NYC ferry horns. They were okay. the the path uh, reconstruction tunnels and the other vessels that are operating on the west side. We were not on the west side at the time, so our horns would be the ones that, that you would hear if you walked down to Pier 11. Um, okay. And even then, those, interestingly enough, I do remember at that specific meeting that you're recalling, speaking with folks that have been down to Pier 11, and they're like, I really can't hear those horns, which is 
there's if you can't get up here 11 where we have literally every line coming in and out you're it's it's, it's not going to be um, the um that you think it to be to be clear you can hear them if you are in a kayak in the river if you are you know other vessels but you should not be able to hear them inside a building um that is well, I think, thank you for that. I think we'll find out. Um, so questions for you. Um, we don't have a queuing plan right now. Um, we don't have a queuing plan right now. Will we have one in a month? We come back in a month. Will we come back and present anything to us between now and starting? Do we have any say in the matter? For sure, yes. I would like to bring a queuing plan back. Um, we have the, the, our ferry operator, Hornblower, has uh, started the initial conversations with New York Waterway, um, which includes slip assignments, which are very, you know, sort of crucial to a queuing plan to make sure that <clears throat> uh, we can understand where passengers are going to be. Um, so we have already reached out to Hornblower and they would like to involve um, obviously New York Waterway in this discussion, but we do we do want to hear from the community board. And so, you know, we have to keep the group very small, but um, we would like the opportunity to do a site visit where we can see one or two people who can um, represent the concerns of the folks here and make sure that we can visualize on the ground, you know, exactly what you're talking about. All right, that's fair. I appreciate that. That would be something to do. Um, before I call on Tammy and Sarah, first Tammy, then Sarah, I'm going to ask a question about the cost. So you said it's two seventy five per per trip if I'm a passenger. Right. What does it cost for you for New York Ferry or EDC to operate? Um, so last in, what are we in fiscal 21 right now? So last fiscal year, um, I might be getting my fiscal years mixed up, but about 2019 ish, um, we had a subsidy of just over $9 and, um, before COVID we were on track to be under that. And our initial, um, our estimations are that by the time we get to the end of the initial contract uh, term, which is in 2023, that we will be between seven and eight dollars in subsidy per rider. And how is the city justifying spending this money on a ferry when the MTA is falling apart? There's so many other issues, and especially after after the pandemic and the closures, the city is yeah. hemorrhaging money. How are we, how are we doing this? How are we, so, how are we doing yeah, this? So, so a couple of things, right? I think, um, the, the, the administration has prioritized trying to give transit equity throughout the city. A lot of the places that we serve with NYC Ferry are not, are very much underserved by other means of transit. And the, the goal of NYC Ferry is to connect people to and from um, destinations that they need to go to, right? Um, and just to, as a reminder, this is also a city endeavor versus MTA, which is a, a state run um, transportation system. Tammy, so Tammy, Sarah, Bob, and then Mariama. Well, Roddy, I'm so delighted that you could, good evening and thanks for coming. And thank you everybody for coming from the new team on the ferry. Um, in parity for the New York City transportation run system, Roddy, you, we operate buses in New York City and local buses pay 275 express buses are far more expensive because it is an express ride. Here we're at a situation with the ferry system that you has been acknowledged that there is a free ferry, which is the quote unquote local. Can you sort of um, explain to the community why this ferry, which is being touted as an express parity with the bus systems? Yeah, so absolutely. So, that's my first. Okay, and hi, Tammy. Good to see. Good to speak with you again. And uh, first time you see the hair. Um, but so yeah, I mean, is is the administration's priority to make sure that we have um, accessible transportation options? And so, frankly, the the two seventy five rate to keep on on par with MTA with MTA fares has been a, a priority for this administration from the beginning, which is 
if we are investing city uh, funds to providing the service, um, the goal is that it will be accessible um, no matter no matter who you are in the city and not having different price points or doing like market rates or anything, right? Because certainly, you know, for all of these transportation options, um, as you mentioned, all of the, all of them are going to be subsidized to some degree, right? Um, so it How is does that work priority. compared to express buses, though? You have express I, buses and local buses. Now we're having an express yeah, ferry yeah. and a local ferry. Uh, so I'm not. A, I, I understood providing transportation. Mm -hmm. The question is why, for the most subsidized form of transportation we currently have in the city, aren't we forming the same type of thing to cut down on the amount that we have to? No, uh, hey, that's a, that's a that's a fair question. I don't know the difference between how. DOT prioritizes pricing versus in other in some routes or in some buses versus others. I don't know the answer, to that, but I know that from the beginning of NYC Ferry, the has been to, to peg it to the MTA system to keep it equitable and affordable for for all riders. So, Tammy, I have a very cynical um, response or or comment to what you're asking. So, in this in Scott Stringer's uh, controller's report, he has has listed that the subsidy for these ferries are unequitably benefiting upper white middle class residents who live on the water. And that's where this is focused on. And uh, my uh, comment, I suppose, is why is this being focused on? Well, because it's focused that's, on that's adjusting that's part and parcel to where I'm going on equity. Yeah. Right. Um, and if you're going to provide a service, we all like more robust transportation options in the city, but it should be operated equitably. So if an express is an express, it is express. You pay more for the express. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, back to the conversation about the uh, Esplanade and the paths. We'd be delighted to set up a walking tour with some people. Brookfield needs to be an integral conversation on that. And I say that simply because uh, one of the concerns for the local community is there is no place, for example, to get a cup of coffee after 9 p.m. in the neighborhood. Um, and the hours that the ferry service is uh, was initially proposed puts you into a desert in terms of uh, food and beverage options and waiting spaces and other things. So is there going to be any type of vending or food and beverage on the pier itself um, in the hours because Brookfield does not currently have anything and did not even pre pandemic past a certain hour other than full service restaurant. That is a, a great question. I know that New York Water Ray used to have a concessionaire on the ferry landing itself, and I don't think that they are there anymore. Um, last I spoke with them about that, just because I was curious, um, they were considering what, what to do with that space. We as NYC Ferry or EDC don't, don't have any plans to do any concessions on the landing itself that's owned by Port Authority and operated by Waterway. But um, we hope that we will be getting back to um, having a concession stand on the ferries themselves. They're closed right now due to COVID, but um, that is usually something we can say is a positive, but I know that doesn't really help folks who are hearing around after that. And for any, just FYI, it was closed pre-COVID as well. Um, oh, it was. Okay. Yes. Thanks for correcting Okay. And yeah, and Tommy just. Go ahead, Roddy. Okay. No, I'm just going to say on, uh, on the other question, happy, happy to coordinate with Brookfield and Battery Park City Authority. We definitely would want to coordinate with, you know, of course, we would always want our partners with the Port Authority and Battery Park City Authority, as well as uh, some of the lead residents in the building that is the closest residential building, which tends to get the short shrift um, with everything that happens at the ferry. Um, moving on to the just well, as we get closer to coordinating, I just want to make sure that we're mindful of social distancing, large, large crowds and just trying to, you know, narrow group that is representative but be of you know crowd capacity i'm just just email lucian he'll take right care of it uh, i have full faith in lucian in the office team getting it set up no problem roddy 
So that kind of moves into my third question that I alluded to, and that was the hours. We have a lot of conversation, hold on. Had to stop my Alexa alarm. Um, we have a lot of conversations about the hours of the service that are there. If you wanna look at comparative service, there is express bus hours and non on uh, Metro North, express train stop, more local service, but the service that was proposed and that's put in the DEIS started far earlier than the New York waterways and went far later, which adds an additional disturbance seven days a week to the community that's surrounding. And for the record, this is still the only dock in the city that is next to a large residential building housing so many. There is no other place in the city and not the east side docks any of them they are all far further away than the closest pinch point to the children's park and the residential building so we asked this knowing that in the environmental impact statement it did say that there is environmental impact however because it was only while the ferry was at the terminal and potentially could be dissipating with wind and things like that if there was any way to look at the hours of operation and have a more modified hours to earlier in the evening and later in the morning and with a reduction as you go, much like with the bus service and everything else. Like rush hour times, right? Correct. Um, I hear you and I, and this is, this was a concern pre COVID. Um, I remember a very packed community board meeting um, in Battery Park City, and this was raised then. Um, you know, we, part of the philosophy within MC Ferry, we don't operate, you know, 24 hours a day, but we do really want to make this as reliable a transportation option as possible. And that means that we are operating most of the day and, you know, we, we don't have special hours that start on weekends or, you know, we turn off our service in the middle of the day and only operate for four hours um, in the morning and evening. Um, and and that's patronizing. No offense, that's incredibly patronizing to what I'm asking you. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you to take a look as a ferry commuter thing to have a recognition in the residential community that you land in and recognize based on usage and everything else that this may not need to be seven days and to take a look at it with a rush hour off peak and off peak hours to accommodate the needs of everybody. I, I'm not asking you to turn it off and it's not like there's a desert. They, there is another ferry. This is the express service. I'm not asking you to turn it off. I'm not saying don't run it sometimes. I'm looking at peak and off peak, much like almost all other transportation forms in the city. Goodness sakes, you don't run to Governor's Island 365 days a year. You only do a peak summer service and we're asking for a service to there. Right, they, I think, that, you know, who knows what the future of Governor's Island will look like. Um, but yes, I, I hear you and we don't, we do have peak and off peak times within our schedules now, you know, so we're not running peak service from 6.30, you know, right at the beginning. Um, and certainly on weekends, um, they're much more spaced out. While we may have a boat that leaves Staten Island at 6.30 on Saturday, it's it's not going to be as frequent as it is Monday through Friday. Um, I can't I can't commit to to anything right now. I I do hear your concern and I'm apologize. My comments sounded patronizing. Um, so I will take it back to the team. Okay, Tammy. I'm so sorry. My, fourth, my fourth and final question goes final to a logistics question that goes to New York Waterway and you. And it's a it's a question that the community has asked. Uh, uh, hundreds of times and it has to do with wake noise emissions design pollution it's a small terminal it's not a large terminal we there has been questions and asked if the later evening terminals would not dock on the north side gunning engines and to have a flip so you are establishing a service so people could learn that it's either on the left or the right and we've heard, well, it's very difficult to change the docks for people. There's only six docks there. If I can walk into Grand Central 
and know that the 703 is on a different platform than the 555. I'm really uncertain why the riders at the start of a service can't be trained the same way. So I, I urge you to use some common sense and care when doing those considerations and work with the New York waterways and the community to recognize the load that puts on the north side early mornings and late at night and to find ways to be able to use the far west side. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for any thank you, Tammy. Sarah. Sarah, you there you have to unmute. You are unmuted. Go ahead. I'm Aunt Tammy covered a lot of what I was going to say, but I'm still curious um, why this is happening. Is this just your company trying to make more money and expand? Or did someone in the city decide, poof, we need another ferry? Which is it? Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll take this. I mean, in back in, um, so as Franny mentioned, you know, we've been operating since the system for about six years now. Um, in 2018, 2019, we undertook uh, an extensive study to hear from different um, community boards, community leadership, elected officials around what landings throughout the city um, they would like to see NYC Ferry expand to. Um, from there, our team gathered around a lot of that information and figured out um, study and from, you know, from a transportation standpoint, um, what conditions would be beneficial um so really this uh, is because we already have a uh, uh, there's I'm sorry? the only reason that you're coming here is that there's already ferry landing that's the only reason correct i don't i don't understand no there are other f existing ferry landings through the city that we're not going to so that is that is not the case now um it makes sense from a planning so go to a ferry landing in soho where it's not served where it's not right near Right. Right. So, so, right. So, you know, part of it is connecting people to and from work. Right. So there are folks that um, all that, as you mentioned, uh, live in the area that would, would be traveling up to Midtown. And there are folks that maybe live in Staten Island that work in Battery Park City in that area. Right. So there are Never a, a connection of touch points from residentials. Of, of last stand here. Nobody's ever complained about that. I'm really curious gotcha. as to who is asking for this because nobody that we know is looking for this. Okay, thank you. Take the Staten Island Ferry. If they come from Staten Island, it's really just not that hard. I understand, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Justine, you are muted. I was muted and I was telling Bob to go ahead. So, okay. <laughs> thank uh, you. If, if I'm up, <clears throat> I I suppose I it, it turns out when I really think about this that I end up being a, a very strong ferry advocate. And I've really thought about it for a long time, so I have uh, typically a lot of points to make, but I'll make them really fast. The first one is that New York has always been a great and historic water city and we've never really taken advantage of that as we should and when i go to places like say istanbul and i see what a wonderful ferry commuter city it is it's just it's a potential we have it's something that we really should develop and in the long term we have to be a water city if we could we move this slide to the one that shows the map real quick Okay, if you if we look at this, we see that there's lots of interactions across the East River, but people who happen to live on the west side of uh, Manhattan don't have any of the advantages of the travel that people for commuting and for all kinds of things. So I turn out to be a heavy user of this, and I love it. I can't think of anyone who would take these things and not love them. So I think of this secondly, as downtown, if we have look at if we ever look at it, we can. 
they're paying and twice our, because they're paying for the ferry and the subway once they get off. But go ahead. I'm not, well, no, they can take. You can get all the way up to Midtown West on this. That's a big difference. And for me, it makes a big difference. I I'm think. Sure and I, I want to. I want to. I, I want to talk about the next thing is that I've treated this 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 wonderful ferry system as a as a very wonderful uh, kind of tourist advantage for the city of New York. And whenever I have people coming from Europe, they're always amazed and pleased to travel up and down that uh, up and down the East River and see the wonderful things we have. But certainly if you're in Fog's Neck or Soundview, it's really a very, very efficient way to commute. That makes sense. So if in the morning, these are pretty good, uh, pretty good transit routes, but for people from Staten Island to get up to Midtown West, I think uh, it's a tremendous advantage for them. And I hope that there'll be some connection from the Battery Park City over to the east side so people can on the water get a connection all the way across. And just in the same way as a bike rider, I really appreciate being able to circumnavigate the city in a kind of green rim. This is kind of a water rim. So this gives us an opportunity to travel the whole of Manhattan just as though as civilians we're in the circle line. The next thing I wanted to say, uh, number four, if I can find it. Well, I can go to five. Say the five. Oh, uh, four is inf infrastructure. I've lived here for 30 years, and so many times the subways break down. So after 9 11, I didn't have the one train for three years, I don't think. After Sandy, we didn't have the one train. All kinds of things break and flood. I think also on 9 11, I, was, I got to witness how many people were taken off off the island by the alternative safety uh, by having those tugs come. This is really a safety value and it's a redundancy for long-term kind of travel if we have breakage. We really are making all these changes, but we really have to invest in excellent subway infrastructure and it stinks. And, the, and I've taken buses for years and they stink. And what happens is we only have the M9, the M20 and those have less and less service every year. So it's really, it's really helping us a lot, at least helps me a lot. The okay. next the next major point I have is about disabilities. I actually qualify as dis, uh, as a disabled person in terms of being blind and having having serious disease. And so I am not allowed by I'm under doctor's orders to not take subways or buses. So I, I'm able to commute to my hospital by the ferry and it makes a very big difference to have something clean and safe and available and i can't be the only one that has that kind of problem the next the next thing is in the long term these things really should be eco ferries and if you and i know we've studied this and that in the bay area they actually have pretty good eco ferries and this is an opportunity in the long term for us to get that right and to move into service as soon as possible, eco ferries. The, the next wait, thing is that two things. In, uh, wait, wait, wait. One thing, um, Lucian, let Robin forced into the participants, please. But then, Bob, finish it up. We're at 38 yep, minutes. Yep. I scheduled 30 for this, but we still have a bunch of other questions plus the attendees. Two more, two more things. One okay. is in terms of flexibility. It's taken, God knows, like 50 years from the Second Avenue ferry. You can't do anything to change the, the subway system here. And it, even to make it better is extremely hard. And we might cut it back extremely. So this actually gives us an alternative. It's so much cheaper and easier to build ferry stations than it is to do something about, about the subways. And we really have to invest in all this stuff. Uh, finally, uh, I think that at least we have coffee at uh, Laughing Man. <laughs> And if they need to have extended hours, at least they're there and they're still running. So I thank everyone for their patience. I'm happy to send this as a list in. I know it's a lot of points, but I really think it's a good thing. I think that you, Bob. As good, huh? I think Brandon and Rahadi would like to hear this as a list because you were very supportive of their position. So it was nice to hear a different side. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for um, listening. No, thank you. Um, all right, Mariama, Betty Kay, Jeff Galloway, and then I'm going to the attendees. 
and we do have to kind of I'll, I'll keep, keep it quick, going because you um you and tammy and tara basically made um a lot of the points and, and asked a lot of the questions that i um otherwise would was, was planning to ask i also had in mind the um controller's report i followed scott's page pretty closely <laughs> um and i don't disagree with bob this is my yeah. problem i just feel like our priorities are really misguided right now and not only in consideration of uh, the lack of diversity in the population that this thing serves but also in consideration of the pandemic where it just required an executive order for food stamps to be increased people are standing all over on lines i don't know if it went through but i just saw it on the news that people the biden had to sign that new york didn't have enough money you know states all over the country didn't have enough money we can't house our, our houseless are homeless. People are outside. People are struggling every day. People getting sick, losing their job. And I just think right now to be focused on subsidizing a redundant service is very, you know, uh, let them eat cake. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mariama. That, that well said. I agree. Betty. Betty, unmute, unmute yourself, Betty. Are you there? Yes, okay, go ahead, go. Um, no. Just wanted to thank and thank Raddy because he's been listening to me since the beginning of this, since I live in the building that is right next to the ferry dock and I overlook it, I'm on that side of the building. Uh, I look forward to the New York City ferry as a very accessible way. I'm a, no, I'm a mobility scooter and I wish all of you who are able-bodied would think twice. You keep denigrating something, I'm excluded from most accessible, most transportation. And yet all of you very cavalierly are saying how redundant it is, how expensive it is. Let me tell you about the subsidies for excessive ride. Let me tell you about the hours that I have to wait for the ride to show up, if it shows up at all. Then they subsidize for $70 a trip. And I get to take someone else with me for free who is also subsidized. So for me to pay 275 and be able to get to Midtown would be so fabulous. Thank you. I really look forward to it. And the people who visit me are tremendously looking forward because I've always been locked out from being able to go places. So this will be great. Thank and you. I so, I'm with Bob Schneck on this one. It's very important to a large swath of population. I think most elderly will be ecstatic. Um, and the subsidy is less than the excessive ride that we would otherwise use. Um, I have been impressed with Pier 11 because I made it my business because of noise to go over and listen. It is quite silent. I kept denying they were even using their horns. Uh, and I realized that Hornblower is a very different group than New York Waterway is as well. So they're not as aggressive and annoying in their use of the horns, but they are much quieter. I I'll vouch for that. It's, it's amazing what a difference it is. Um, I also want to say that when it comes to the food, I acknowledge I'm glad Bob already brought up the laughing man, but they are right there near the dock. As far as lines are concerned, because I'm so close to them, uh, lines were really only an issue when the path replacement was in, was, were moving. In that case, they had the lines extend directly across the Esplanade and it blocked anybody trying to get up or down the Esplanade. Typically what happens is they line up north and south of it along the around the edge. So along that fencing, and they really don't get in the way, except for maybe people sitting, enjoying the view from a couple of the benches that are the closest to the ferry dock. And it's for a very limited it's summertime for a few hours a day, if that's even an issue. So I think you'll have plenty to work with and I'd be happy to scout that out. Uh, I also hope that it'll provide some transportation for Borough of Manhattan Community College students. We're a quick walk over to that. And that is a major educator, has about 25,000 students. They come from all different parts of Manhattan, as well as other parts of New York City. Uh, so I will, this is where I usually get after Raddy about this. Uh, yes, it'll be good to consider eventual extensions that would cover more of the areas that draw students to the Borough of Manhattan Community College. 
uh, because I really do want to be an advocate for them. They're an important part of our district. Uh, and I also want to remind you that I always get back to the fair fares as well as transfers for people who at least financially should qualify for those programs because it can be an extra burden for them to get that last mile or to get uh, to a shift to a bus route. We are right next to a city, dock, dock, city bike dock here at the Battery Park City. So it would be a great to be able to transfer there for people to move on. And so I think those things can be worked out. And so far, Raddy and his crew have been very helpful about wanting to talk about those things. So I think there are future plans for what we can do. So thank you. I look forward Betty, Betty, thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad to hear your comments about the noise because that would be something that I don't have to hear, but you know, I'm not facing it, but I'm glad to hear your comments about that as a positive thing. And thank you for sharing your position. Um, Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> I've tried to listen to um, all the points that everyone has been making, and I think everybody has made some very good points. Um, I have to say, though, that I'm coming down uh, in agreement with the Betty and Bob. Uh, I'm not sure I ever thought I would say that after Bob had spoken for more than four or five minutes that I agree with every single thing he says. I usually say I agree with about half of what he says, but I think I agree with every single thing that Bob just said. Um, I, I do believe that the subsidy issue is an important one that needs to be considered and thought about. Um, however, all public transportation is subsidized to some degree. This one seems to be more than most, although apparently not as much as Accessoride. Um, I, I think we also need to keep in mind that we are representing not only the residents of Battery Park City uh, or Community Board 1, but the people who work in Community Board 1 as well. As we all probably remember from our applications, you can apply if you work here or you live here. Uh, and, and certainly, I think. Uh, Perry benefits people who work here, and it certainly benefits at least some of the people who live here. Uh, I know that I, for one, would certainly take it to Midtown if it were available. Um, and and I think Betty's points about accessibility are are absolutely valid. So I mean, I think there are some impacts that we need to make sure that are not, um, um, uh, you know, that are appropriately taken into account. There's been a lot of improvement in the emissions of, of ferries, and, and I'm hearing now that the, that the horn issue, which you know unfortunately is a legal requirement, but the the the, the particular horn volume seems to have been uh, decreased in recent years, which is certainly a positive there. So I I, uh, I, I acknowledge all of the uh, sort of the negative aspects of having a ferry terminal here, but I think there's an awful lot of positive aspects both for our district and certainly for the city as a whole. That's my view. And very interesting. Thank you so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. <coughs> Do you guys have, I know we're going to go then to the, anybody else on the board? I don't see, but Roddy and, um, do you have anything, any comments or you're just happy to hear some positive thoughts and, and Franny, just positive thoughts and positive I, feedback. I, I've been taking a uh, pretty extensive day. I'm, I'm glad to hear all the perspectives on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is nice to get a balance. I'm glad for it. Um, all right, um, let's uh, let's go to Matthew Fenton and then Taylor Banning. Um, Lucian, unmute Matthew, Matthew first, then Taylor, please. Am I connected? Uh, hi, I have four questions. First is if your horns are quieter than horn blower than um, New York Waterway, how are you still in compliance with the U.S. Coast Guard rules that require ferry horns back you now to be audible for half a mile. And what happens if the Coast Guard tells you that you're not in compliance and you need to start blasting the same volume as New York Waterway? Hi, Matthew. Um, so we, we have <clears throat> yearly inspections of all of our vessels with the Coast Guard and they have never uh, told us that we are not in compliance. Um, I'm not the fleet manager, that, that would be our colleague Ethan, but um, I, I will uh, leave it there. Then um, going to the issue of timing, are you prepared to commit now that you're not going to present this community board with a fait complete about the queuing plan, which would come down to if you don't have one because there's just three more meetings left before you launch this service, 
if you don't have one within a reasonable amount of time in advance of launching, let's say with two meetings left, will you commit to delaying the launch of the service in order to reach a consensus with the community board? I'll, I'll put a slight reframing to that. Uh, what we have done in literally every single landing that we have in the city that you see on the map is work on such of a queuing plan. And a lot of them are either alongside an esplanade or near residential area. Um, so we have absolutely been able to do that. Um, so we will work with you all. We will work with Batty Park City Authority. We work with Brookfield, anyone else that you bring accordingly. As far as delay, committing today to delaying a route, that is not something that I'm able to do. But meaning committing if you don't reach to, consensus to, to, to or if you don't have it far enough in advance, you're just going to pull the trigger and launch this thing regardless of no sign, no buy-in from the community or the community board. But I think you, as the community board that represents um, Wall Street, I think you, you all, we've been we've been working with the with the community board at large on a lot of these plans um, and, and a lot of the queuing, and it, I, I think we will be able to reach an, an understanding. Uh, this landing, I'm not. I, as things stand now, Hornblower effectively alienates from public use tens of thousands of square feet of public space within the battery for lines and a security screening tent. Um, how can you offer a guarantee that something similar isn't going to happen on the Esplanade here? Um, we, we don't oversee Hornblower on the statue cruises. Um, that is, that's a national park service. Um, we do oversee them here. So we will, they, they don't have free reign. Okay. Um, Hornblower's corporate debt was recently downgraded to junk status. And in order to raise more money that they desperately needed, they had to pledge as collateral their roots at Niagara Falls before anybody would give them a dime. Given their distress, what happens if they implode? Does this whole thing disappear? And if so, how much public money is at risk if, if they just evaporate? Um, they... We we pay them for this service, um, and so we are paying the bills for this service. And we we do not think that there are um, other business organizations and in, in other places are putting NYC Ferry at risk. All right, thank you. Last question would be because this connects Empire State Outlets to Brookfield Place to Hudson Yards. How is this something other than a subsidy? to three giant shopping mall developers? And how is such a subsidy prudent in light of the fact that brick and mortar retail appears to be dying? And that's my last question, thank you. I mean, I would also, I would also consider, yes, those, those are uh, large uh, retail destinations, but also uh, very large business districts, right? Like the, this area in Midtown West are very large business districts. So it is con connecting people to places where they work, live and work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Although um, it's interesting because sorry, sorry, sorry for the echo. But it's interesting because with the COVID-related work from home, home um, it seems like a lot of people are not going into businesses, and that's a whole other issue. And we're still moving forward with this without seeing the, the fallout of whether people actually return to the office. But nobody has a of a, a, crystal ball to know what's going to happen next. But that would be a reason to slow this down. But all right, um, Taylor Banning, and then we are going to close this down. And I thank you both for being here and listening to all this. So Lucian, un unmute Taylor. Hi, thank you. I just had a quick question. On the Hudson side, why isn't the ferry uh, scheduled to have stops all the way up west side of Manhattan? It seems sort of focused just on downtown. Not sure why it wouldn't continue up. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, as, I, as I alluded to earlier, when we launched our study, uh, one of the one of the things that we found was a lot of the places northern, uh, more north than 39th Street are, it, it's just not as time competitive um, because you get closer to where the A train is and other um, transportation options versus this landing. So um, those were our findings um, in 2019. You know, the, the world will continue to change and evolve, and transportation options continue to change and evolve. So, um, once we once we launch these routes, um, I, I can't speak to the future, of it, but for now, um, these were the ones that that were more uh, more feasible. 
Thank you. Taylor, you're done. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who participated. Justine? Yes. I, I, I just a, a quick question. Um, oh, please. Uh, just planning curiosity. Uh, what's the latest on the um, which birth the, stat, uh, the citywide fair will be using in St. George? Has EDC selected the location yet? Oh, yes. Um, construction has started. We're building a new ferry terminal um, that is adjacent to the Staten Island Ferry. So it's right down Wall Street, if you know where that is. Um, the, the baseball field is, is right to your left, and the Staten Island Ferry is maybe a five minute walk. To your right, if you're looking at the water, we're building a pier off of that um, off of that esplanade. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. No, thank you for being here and putting up with all of our questions. We appreciate it. I, I thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. No. All right. Let's have a great day. Yeah, you too. Take care. We look forward to hearing back from you as to what the next steps are. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Lucian, would you put the, um, oh, I guess, yeah, there you go, ready to leave it back, and then you put the agenda back up. Sure, I'll, I'll just switch a couple settings over and I'll throw it right back up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sorry. Because I don't remember what's next, sorry. Um, Esplanade Pedestrian Management. Ah, we're gonna talk about West 10th Street and the garden restoration update. From Maureen Murphy, is that correct? Yes. So I believe that Maureen Murphy um, is not available to attend today. Let me just check the, the guest list. list. Um, I think that there is the, the snow um, kind of pushed off a couple of internal things there. Let me just quick check to see that's, yeah, that is the case. You said that. Um, um, uh, some of the they had to attend to some of the internal kind of events that were um, uh, messed around by the, the snow event. So I think that she would like to come next month if that's okay. Yeah, it'd be nice to know. Although hopefully by next month it's going to be done. But um, let's see. I did get an email. So did you um, from Will. Let's see if I can find it. Maureen Murphy was the, she's the one for the Brookdale, right? Yeah. So for um, the culmination of West Thames Street and Gardens Restoration, I am going to share some. Yeah, so I'm sorry, and, I jumped it. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. I'm going to sh share some photos and uh, read what Will sent. Yes. And is Will here or no? He couldn't make it no, up. He, he couldn't make it, no. Okay. I will just pull this up. Look at it. Nice pictures without the snow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, I see. So Brookdale's not coming. That's okay. That makes sense. I'm sorry. I'm trying to read on my cell phone while having the computer on and I couldn't see and I just read too far down. Because you yeah, will send a nice email. Explaining. Yeah. Okay, so I have it up here. I'm going to read it out to everyone and I'll mm -hmm. cycle through some of the photos. Um, he said, I'm writing with a few updates on the Rector Bridge restoration. Um, you're glad to be nearing completion of the work after the COVID delay. I'll also share some photos with you from 128. Um, I've put these photos in the link that's on live.mcb1.nyc. There's a mm -hmm. link to uh, files for the meeting. So all those photos um, can be found there. So people can cycle along through those if it's easier than seeing them on the screen. Um, so here's four points he sent along. First is he said uh, they had a productive EDC had a productive walkthrough with BBCA on 128. Uh, substantial completion in the coming days, allowing for the areas to open. Next point is that the main item left the surface paint is surface paint on the basketball court, which needs 45 degrees minimum outdoor temperature um, to set. The next point is that the garden, basketball air, court area, sidewalk will all be ready to open next week. However, 225 Rector facade work has a few more days and they are sharing some construction fencing with our project. 
uh, which would prevent opening the above coordination call this afternoon to determine best next steps slash timeline. Uh, final completion by the spring. And if we have any questions. Yes, I or, do have a I'm bunch of questions. Some of these, um, Let's look at the pictures. So how many extra plots of, of garden plots do we have? Six, eight, ten? I can't see. Well, I don't think it's apples to apples because they seem to be far longer. So yeah. I would say it's the equivalent. Each one's equivalent of two of the previous plots with a little bit of additional square footage mm -hmm. uh, since there's no gap. But I, it appears that there's at least one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven, eight on the other mm -hmm. side of the, the other far tall planters. And yep. the two tall planters, I'm not sure what those are for, but maybe for some other kind of different crops. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure, certainly. Uh, I think the taller ones are for handicap accessibility. Oh, oh cool. nice. That's Thank you, idea. Kathy. All right. This looks to be the artificial turf. All right, so that's been happening. That's the whole area. Um, you can see that there's still some these materials here. Here to be Belgian block on some of the trees and we're putting in the uh, grit and the blocks. And one more photo. And this is from January 28th. Yeah, they couldn't get much over the weekend because I can see this out my window, but the scaffolding is still there. So my biggest question is, when are they going to open up the walkway? Then that's not going to be the spring, yeah? Is that, that's what I couldn't, that's what I'm looking forward to having him here to talk about. Because that is the hugest problem. It's clear. I mean, it's clear here. I get they can't do the basketball court until they paint it. The weather has so not been the, since the sidewalk will be ready to open next week. And I hope that's what he means. Like the sidewalk he means the walkway. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lucian, it's but I can uh, really a, it's yes. it's Nick Spordone. I can yeah. add I can try to yeah. add some clarity, Justine, if it's helpful for the committee. Yes, please. Um, and again, I'm caveating this by saying this is kind of just what I'm getting from from the crew there. It's uh, the EDC project in the building, but the long and the short of it is, yes, the, we, the sidewalk we want to try and have reopened. I'm not, I, I don't know that I can say as soon as next week, I would say hopefully in the coming weeks at issue is, as Will had noted in his his email, which was very helpful, 225 Rector, which, which fronts that sidewalk in question itself has some uh, facade work being done pursuant to local law 11, which is uh, required um, normal inspections. They are, as I understand it, almost done with all the work. It's just a matter of actually getting, uh, finishing it up. That side of the building, the east side of the building, I think is almost completely done. I think what's left for them is some facade work on the north and the south ends of the buildings. So the idea is they're going to try to um, see if they can take down the sidewalk shed on the on the east side, which would then allow the sidewalk to open back up. Uh, and hopefully that will happen in the next uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. And that makes sense. But Nick, I mean, the whole yeah. point of these these sheds is that they're making it so you can pass through. So I, if they need to have the, the 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 shed in the air here, that makes sense. I suppose they need it, but the op we should be able to walk through here. And for example, if you look at this, I mean, you guys did the walkthrough, but I could see a clear path walking, you know, a little bit on the grass, whatever. It, it looks like there's no sheds whatsoever. It, it, it's your fence or your fence. It's, it's, it's uh, the fence that's blocking the pathway on this picture. Somebody who's not me and can actually see, tell me. Yep. It looks like this fence with the signs is the only thing that's blocking it. I have a picture I can send you uh, that shows the fencing from the point towards West Thames. Justine's actually correct. There's no reason not to open that up. Now, assuming they've got to get their junk out of there, granted there's a snowstorm, whatever else, but um, perhaps you still need to have the stairs blocked off somewhat, whatever else, that's that's not it. But Nick, that's got to open. It's it's a pain in the neck not having that open. It's been, we've been out without it. Really we have a resolution, time. Justine, that you passed during COVID requesting yes. that to be open as quickly as possible. So, um, 
you know, if they're telling me that they have to wait for the snow to melt, okay. And they need it to get warm enough. But again, I don't really know I want it to be warm enough to paint the basketball courts because that could take weeks. Aren't we in a polar vortex now? <laughs> Those are my comments. Open well, up the pathway. I, I would I would ask one question, Justine, actually, and Tammy, if it's okay. This actually is exactly the type of thing we want to try and get some feedback on. I am I am of the opinion. This is with respect to the basketball courts, I should say. Hold yeah. on, let me put myself on camera so I'm not uh, kind of the man behind the curtain here. <laughs> okay. Um, I am of the mind, and I think BPCA generally is of the mind, of if there is the availability to open the basketball courts, even when the weather is still a little too cold to do that kind of top coat, mm -hmm. I think we'd want to try and make those courts available and then maybe you just have to close them again when the, when, the, when the coating is done, right? Rather have them open for a little bit than have them closed throughout. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. Um, so basically what I'm saying is yes. Anything. Yeah, is no, 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 no. Okay. No, it's not going to do that because what, uh, as I understand the process, I'm not an engineer, but as I understand yeah. the process, whatever's on the courts at the time, if it's dirt or grime or mud, they're kind of power washed anyway before the kind of the top coat put on. It's a fairly, you know, in-depth procedure. Okay. So the thinking is, if we can get those courts open for, you know, a few weeks or so, uh, even while the weather is still too cold to actually do the, the top coating, at least have them open for the benefit of the community. I mean, the community has been waiting for them. You could do stuff there, uh, even if and then, and, and, then, yeah. and, then, and then close them down again. I know it's not ideal, but, you know, I was thinking back to even when the West Thames Bridge itself opened up itself, there was, you, you recall, going back a bit, we opened it up because we wanted to make sure that the, the community had access to it. It then had to close for a little bit while I finished the east side stairs and um, and landing. But the idea was, to the extent that it's available for people, let, let it be open. So if it's all the same to you all, I think uh, to the extent that there's, there's a window there to open it, we'd want to do it even if we then have to reclose it a little bit to do the final coating rather than keep it closed all the way through. People are urging to get outside. Yeah, I agree. Um, Betty? Please. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, no, yeah. thanks. I was going to say, I, I agree with that too. I would just put up a lighthearted sign on the door where, where people can get in to say, you know, open for now, you know, but to inform people that it'll be closed later to, later to, to clean it up so and that they can up, anticipate yeah. that later rather than condemning it later when it's closed or complaining to everybody about how trashy it looks and is this the best the authority can do and so if there's just a lighthearted sign would open and says enjoy for now when the weather gets good we're going to have to finish it off just let people know that makes sense betty good very good point because yes there are people who are gonna yeah they'll be complainers one way or the other so that's a very good point and uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Kathy, go Betty, ahead. we should bring you on staff. That's a great idea. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, last year during the construction, we lost uh, water to the hoses all along one side of the garden. And I'm just wondering if that's gonna be uh, restored by in time for the spring gardening season or might that go longer? It's an issue, actually, I'm gonna text Matt right now. That was an issue I know that uh, they had inadvertently, I think, cut one of the water lines. Kathy, thank you for that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's been resolved, but let me text Matt now and see. Um, but yes, that should be that should be back in place. Yeah, it's, along, it's along the um, sidewalk side, not the west yes. side. Yeah. That, that, that should be back in place for the gardener. So uh, let me see if I can confirm that offline now. But yes, I, I will check. I'm aware of it and it should be addressed. Thank you. You're muted, Justine. That's why I'm saying to Bob to talk, and he, I'm telling him he's muted. Oh, how funny. Thank you. Bob, if you have something to say, if you're, yep, looks like your hand is up and you've got something to say, yep, so yep. please go ahead. I wonder, it's such a coincidence that it's so hard. You're always muted before I come on. What's that? Anyway, I wanted to say uh, that I'm really happy with these amenities i think they really matter uh of course being having been an advocate of the bridge when the bridge was in place it made sense to keep it it's not in place uh these are real amenities and they really 
uh, matter to people. I'm glad to see that that big green yard a little bigger. Uh, I'm glad to see that there's a place to play basketball, and that at least a few families are going to benefit from this um, from this uh, park. And I didn't know at the beginning that this actually belonged to the garden and was taken away. I had no idea that was true. There's three things I would like to ask for. Um, one is, uh, now that all this is over, I'm interested in the total budget of the restoration plus the cost of the construction of the uh, West Thames Bridge, because now all well, the numbers are in and we can finally see what the whole thing costs. And I think I think it's going to be, you know, somewhere north of 55 million, but we'll, we'll see. The other thing is I'm interested in access to the covenants uh, underneath West Street on the east side of West Street because uh, I approached the um, Department of Transportation and I was cut off in lots of different ways and that was unfortunate. And then I also wasn't allowed access to certificates of occupancy um, for the buildings out there. So those are the three things I'd ask for. I'm very pleased with the work though and congratulations on getting it done. Thank you, Bob. All right. If nobody else has anything to say, I think we can close this. Just, just one Bob. comment, Justine. Um, a big thank you for this, building on what Bob said. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but the wait list for community garden plot is probably in the five to six year zone right now. And uh, it's going to make a big joyous difference to a lot of people, especially if we have another season of COVID and people can get outside and do something physical. So thank you. Hey, Justine, can I quickly ask Nick um, and that he could take back to the team about some shoveling around the site? Yes. For the sidewalks along Albany, there seems to be a lot of snow still around. And I'm not sure if that's the responsibility of the residential building or the BPCA or the construction team to sort of be able to manage the area so the pedestrian experience is a little bit better in the snow. Sure. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, Tim, you want to connect offline if you have specific areas for sure, let me know and we'll get them to the right place. Our folks Bob have been out Schneck. there. Uh, but yeah, for sure. Bob Schneck has some incredible photos he can share with you. Send them, please. Uh, and then also Kathleen, um, I heard back from Matt actually, and yes, the water line is fixed and uh, fixed and reviewed. It should be good to go. I believe that would have been handled on the walkthrough we did with them. I wasn't on it, but he just confirmed for me. So we should be, uh, we should be ready to flow. Great, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's good. And then ask him to remove the damn signs, please. I know, uh, the damn the fences. Thing. So we yeah. can open it up, please. But no, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is great. Maybe when the snow is gone, we can actually walk down that block. That would be wonderful. Thank you. All right. All right. So now I think maybe we, okay, we're skipping Brookdale. And we can jump to, you know what, Nick, how about we let Patrick go first? Because poor Patrick. And then you go last. Is that fair? Of course. Of course. I always hate making him go last because he's always rushed. Go ahead, Patrick. Unmute yourself and you go. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Patrick? A day at a time. So we just got over the blizzard. So uh, moving forward, right? A day at a time. Uh, yep. Basically, on all the reports for uh, this January, they're all down except for lost and found property. Uh, that's up. Uh, all the property that's being left in the ball field now is being brought down to our office. So mm -hmm. anybody that's, uh, you know, looking for stuff or believe they lost it in the ball field, they need to come down where we are. We have it in the conference room. You know, dealing with scooters, basically it's scooters. Uh, yeah. They keep leaving them in the ball field and when they lock it up, we end up taking the scooters down with us. Mm -hmm. okay. A whole stash of scooters. What's the deal with the homeless people? So when it says zero, that means there's nobody here or that means you just had no encounters? Uh, that means we had no, we had no encounters, uh, you know, 
and there was nobody sleeping on a bench or sleeping on the ground or anything else like that. That's what the zero means. Okay. Uh, you know, you have to remember this month we did have a, a cold spell. Yes. You know. Yeah, we did. So, not the place so, to be. Right. It's not the place to be outside. Yeah. You know, uh, we did have one graffiti incident, and that was, again, dealing with... Uh, uh, yield to pedestrian sign over by the blue lights. You know, um, we did have uh, two males trying to put up a, a homemade sign on the West Ham Bridge about hunger strikes, demanding freedom from ICE. They <laughs> put that up, um, you know, and within, you know, within about five minutes, we were able to get it down. So uh, that that's really it. Uh, we did have an incident down in PRA where a vehicle, I believe a driver got disoriented and ended up hitting one of the huge boulders down there and coming onto PRA Plaza. Ooh, and nobody so, hurt? Nobody hurt, they drove off. Oh, wow. They drove off. It was like uh, they wanted out of there. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, nobody was hurt. Right. So, you know, thankfully, it was pretty much a quiet month because of the cold. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so Pat, I have to say, because I promised that I would, but, you know, Alexi, he's been emailing me. I've told him to stop emailing you, but um, he's been emailing me and Kathy um, and just reminding or letting me know every time someone who's an ambassador is walking in and out of that, you know, Liberty Court office um, without a mask. And he says pretty consistently that people are doing that and, and unmasked, you know, and, and a little bit of it is him being a little um, too strict, if you want to say that, because it's like if you're walking out the door and then you're slowly putting the mask on, he'll tell me that. Uh, but sometimes people are walking blocks away without a mask. So I'm just going to say again, it's great that they're distributing face masks. They need to wear them in public spaces and outside. So, you know, that's all. And, and oh. I'll follow up with that. Uh, they should be wearing the mask definitely outside. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I'm sorry, I, I've asked him to stop bothering you because most of his situations are not um, emergent or, uh, you know, but he's making a point. And, and the fact that it's happening all the time and it, it, it is something to pay attention to. So just let them know you've got people watching. So masks or masks. I don't know if Moriyama's hand is up and Bob's hand is up to speak to Patrick, but if so, Moriyama first, unmute yourself, and then Bob. Yes, I wanted to ask, do we take it into presumption that the, um, the homeless people were maybe moved to some sort of shelter, or do we know that for sure? Truthfully, on my end, I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't know that. I know that we didn't call anybody to remove anybody. Because then uh, that would have been reflected uh, with the homeless reports. It would have been done. So uh, there was no one even in dire straits with the freezing cold to even call. Correct. Them. Correct. Because you guys have done that in the past, correct? Yes. Yes, we have called 311. Uh, we've had the police there also at times. Mm -hmm. And they have offered services sometimes. Very rarely the homeless person would take it, but most of the time they're refusing. Yeah, that's what that's what I understand for the most part, at least from the guys that I would talk to. But I also haven't not that I've been out lately, but I haven't seen our, our usual our usual folks in the neighborhood. So I'm thinking they maybe moved on because it's too cold. Well, that's the whole thing. A lot of. Uh, a lot of emergency uh, hotel rooms were taken over. So um, I'm thinking that there's a possibility that they were scooped up as part of that, you and know, that where they be, went inside. That would be wonderful if that's the case. Getting a roof over their heads is so much preferable to being outside. So Right, but, that's you good. know, there's, there's no way of verifying that, you know. No, I mean, yeah, not from our end. Um, okay, Mariam is on mute. Bob, you're up. Okay, I just wanted to uh, make three observations. There are actually three, three homeless incidents that I've seen kind of consistently. 
One is uh, a woman and a man right next to the police memorial. And they were camping out there for a few days and then they, I, I haven't seen them in a while. Then there was one, you know, where there's that little bow bridge on, uh, on the South Cove. Mm -hmm. Just about where yeah. the just about where the Christmas tree was, there was a guy there who had a couple of shopping carts, who spent you know pretty close to three weeks, um, kind of camping out on one of those benches, kind of right in front of the, right in front of the Christmas tree, and they've been gone for a while now. And then the most amazing one is just if on the um, on the promenade. Um, kind of just south of the Wagner Hotel, there was, there was a guy who was sleeping out night every night for two months. And he was sleeping under this, I don't know if anyone, somebody else must have seen him. He had this very oversized golf umbrella that he slept under. And he really, he had the best equipment for that. So he had all this warmth equipment that he put on. And he survived that up until the last just three or four days before the blizzard and then he's left. So I've seen a, I've seen at least three of homeless persons sleeping on benches. But then I wonder myself if I got driven out of my house, what that what would I do? And I have had I in my life have had a few experiences in homeless shelters. And they're grungy, clueless, and kind of dangerous. And so I, I can understand why people do that. And I think we have a lot to work on as a city and as on individual human beings to get the issue right. So that's my observation. Thank you, Bob. I agree with you. All right. Anybody else? I don't see anybody else. So I am going to move on to Nick for the report. And then we'll close this down. Nick, bring us home. Uh, okay, I can do this in like eight minutes, Justine. I'm going to try and bring it home for you. Um, I'm, Lucian, I'm timing you. <laughs> well, now the pressure is on. Lucian, thank you very much. Uh, so just on page one every, every month, um, sadly, I guess since April, we've been leading with COVID. I usually have kind of a hero image up there. Uh, this month, I've swapped it out. We're going to start doing this. This is the statewide COVID vaccine tracker, which is available on uh, the state's website. I've included the link below, but it kind of gives you a breakdown daily. It's updated, I think, every morning around 11 or noon or so. Uh, total amount of vaccines administered, first and second dose, uh, and then it breaks out on the side there in large, in large numbers. First doses administered, second doses, et cetera, received. And then the total uh, healthcare distribution sites. So 92% first doses have been administered based on the numbers they've gotten in uh, so far. We'll keep updating that. Scrolling down, um, as we know, vaccination is underway. You have to meet certain criteria to be able to uh, be qualified for it. Uh, I've included the hyperlink there about whether or not you're eligible, but essentially people 65 and older, first responders, teachers, public transit workers, et cetera. Um, what I've also done at the top of page two, if helpful, is, and you guys will probably know this as well, New York City maintains the New York City COVID-19 vaccine binder. So you can update, you can just punch in your zip code there and uh, get a list of sites that are, that are nearby uh, to you. There's also a state uh, network of state-run sites distributing the vaccine. Uh, and you can also click on that and the links I've included. I've included the link to the dashboard, as I said, and then updates to the local to, to the daily coronavirus updates from the state if interested uh, percent positivity rates in battery park city we remain low well below the citywide average it's about eight and a half percent or so over the last week or so maybe a little higher but the city in battery park city we had a small uptick um, but still about lower than three percent in the south actually up uh, down from what it was a little higher and the south um, and the north is just over three percent it was up uh, 3.6 is like, now down to 3.4. It seems like we had an uptick like at, at the third week of January for both places. Yeah. And, now it's going, and even in the city, and now we're going down again. Right. Which is and we, we holiday, saw one right? a little bit after, right after New Year's as well. We saw a little bit, a little bit uptick in early January when last I came to you, and then it was low for most of the rest of the month. Um, okay. Uh, COVID-19 rapid testing in BPC. You'll see the picture of the truck there. I've spoken with a couple of you in the interim between last meeting and this. 
This is the first of what is envisioned to be up to three trucks in Battery Park City. This is rapid COVID testing, low cost, available to folks who essentially would want to, let's say, hey, I want to I want to go out to dinner because open uh, indoor dining is starting up again, as we know, on February 14th at 25% capacity. Or I want to go shopping and I want to just get a quick test to see whether I can go. Um, that one is located at now the, uh, you'll see that that's New York City Police Memorial Plaza. It's eight to six daily. Those, those hours may end up expanding once we kind of get past this initial ramp up. Uh, and it'll be there through at least February 28th. In the coming weeks, we would expect to see some additional trucks, one in the Irish Hunger Memorial in the north and one uh, down at PRA Plaza. So uh, folks from around downtown would have the ability to come in and get uh, relatively quick testing. It takes about 15 minutes. So, um, Nick, I have to, to I have to interrupt you to ask a question. So the cost is $25 a test. Yeah. Why didn't we get somebody? First of all, thank you, because this is a nice thing to do. It's nice to have it here. This is this is a lovely step in the right direction. But why didn't we get someone who will take insurance and or not charge and just, you know, $25 is expensive. So there are people who work here, even people who live here who can't afford the $25 to take the test. And people who are yeah. paying for insurance, uh, me, I don't want to pay $25 to take the test. It's a, I mean, it's a very good question. I think, I think I mean, the first thing I would say is if there is someone who is offering rapid COVID tests for free, then by all means, yeah. send us a permanent the application. Is and we want, we, we, right we on want to get you. We want to get in Battery Park City. What, what's the name of it? City MD is doing oh, it. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, so no, this is. No, there's CMD places. I mean, I had one at City MD too. But yeah. The difference there was, I had to wait in line for three hours. Mm. I got my name on a list, and then they called me back later in the day and said you can come get it. So it was great. It was free, mm. but this was within 15 minutes you can get it. So I think there's I, also I, I, a I truck. Think the, I, I think they would. I think the. I think. Let me say this. Sorry, I didn't I think interrupt the you. The point is that it would be a, there would be a, there was a convenience associated with it and. Um, that's why there, there may be some cost. But if there's an ability for folks to do it rapid at, for, for free, yeah. then we want those people to apply. We want to get them in Battery Park City. There, there's also a truck, I think it's called, I don't know if it's LabCorp or Lab something, underneath, uh, under the, by the FDR Drive, under the FDR Drive, north of the South Street Seaport, but around the okay. Street area, that's free. Can I, can I interrupt? No lines. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, whoever wants to speak. Yes, speak. Is that Robin? Yes, it hey, is. Robin. Hey, Robin. Yeah, it yeah. is. But go ahead. Go ahead. I have to say that on a personal level, I'm offended by the position of that truck in front of the police memorial. Okay. And I wonder why it couldn't be relocated to the north, uh, perhaps, or to the south, or even to the east. But to be right in front of the police memorial seems very, to me, very disrespectful. And um, I just wanted to register that. I think there are other locations for a truck than right there. For people that go to the memorial to honor their loved ones, their deceased family members. Yeah, it, it's just, it is a commercial enterprise. Yes, they're performing a service, yes. but they're performing a service for profit. And um, while I, I guess that Battery Park City is not making any money except perhaps on the permit, it just feels, to me, it feels wrong and not in the spirit of what Battery Park City Authority ought to be doing. In that okay, location. I can take it back. Thank but, you, yeah. Robin. But, but yeah, not, not the COVID testing, but you mean in that location, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the testing is important yeah. and it should be accessible. We're in a not very accessible neighborhood. Yeah. No, I mean, it is. It would be great. Even, even out on South End Avenue, for example, but in front of the police memorial is just yeah. really, you know, I think disrespectful. That's all I'll say. And is it like <laughs> a... Thank you. How do they stay warm? Is it like constantly? I, I haven't been out there. Is it con is it smelly like um, with diesel and stuff like that, or or how does it run? Oh, um, I mean, I assume the folks inside the, the staff is is inside the truck. Uh, I don't know that it's diesel fuel. I can I can confirm I for you. Yeah, yeah I mean, check. I'm just wondering. I mean, that would be something I would assume that the authority would pay attention to in terms of the pollution. Sure. Because, right, because, I mean, I, you know, it's too cold to not idle the engine, but 
I'm right. hoping they're not idling their engines. <laughs> well, hopefully it gets warmer, but yeah, I, I will check for yeah. you. All right, thank you, thank you, Nick. And I'm sorry, sure. I lost about no, the no, cost. No, um, no, no, it's it's completely okay. It's completely okay. Um, but I like the that, idea. And the next well, thing to the, tell you is, let's get some ahead. vaccines down here. I heard that Biden is going to be releasing um, COVID vaccines to to um, pharmacies next yes, for, as early as next lip, week. Let's get them to Friday. To the, to the vaccine makers' ears. Yes, I. The, the, as much as we can get that out, we want to we want to try to coordinate. We're obviously operating within kind of the the framework that the state lays out, but for sure, yes. to the but extent yeah. that we can extend it, and if we can make Battery Park City available to as a site for that as well, we'd want to do it. That would be great. Um, so thank you. And right, this is exactly ahead. what I we want to hear in the you. trucks. No, no, it's okay. We want to hear about the trucks, what people like, what people don't. So I can take that feedback back. Mm -hmm. No, um, winter storm Orleana, uh, um, uh, Orlina, I should say. We are uh, thankfully, I think most of it is behind us now. You all should have seen kind of the the blog post that we had blasted out. Um, but as we have it as of now, the evening of Wednesday, February third, the blog post has been updated as well. So the West Thames Bridge Street elevators are reopened, public restrooms, the ball fields, PRA perimeter walkway, Liberty Park. And New York Waterway Service has all been restored and running essentially back to normal. So, um, mostly this, mostly today, this afternoon, and by tomorrow, aside from cleanup in certain areas, most of that should be uh, all back up and running. Um, just some pictures of our crew out there doing uh, doing yeoman's work, yeoman and women's work, cleaning out uh, the paths and keeping them clear uh, for folks. Um, Community reminders I just put there from last month, but we have those areas of Wagner Park and Rockefeller Park open for the full season as well. Um, top of page four is an unfortunate incident, which we've all spoken about. I think I called Tammy late that night and Justine you as well to give you the heads up that there was a Confederate flag found tied to the doors of the Museum of Her Jewish Heritage on January 8th. Obviously a heinous act. We were invited and very, uh, we're very honored to attend a vigil that PSIS 276 had planned for their neighbors across the street the following week on the, on the 14th. So there's a statement there that we had issued, uh, when it first, uh, when we were first made aware of it. We've been in obviously constant contact with the museum as we are and offered annual assistance. It is under state and city uh, law enforcement law enforcement investigation. Um, so thanks to our neighbors for that and uh, important for folks to know that we stand united against uh, hate and it won't ever find quarter here in Battery Park City. Black History Month, as we know, is uh, February. Um, so stay tuned to uh, our social media channels and YouTube over the course of the month. We'll have some programs and I'll use this as an opportunity for a plug, which is the top of the next page. Speaking of black history and black artists, Mildred Howard, as we know, has uh, the installation on Belvedere Plaza. That's the house that shall not pass for any color than its own. It's at the top of page five there, Lucian. Uh, we included a picture actually that was someone who took that picture from inside the house. Um, Right after the snowstorm, which was really quite something okay. to see. Uh, that's again as a reminder on in, on view through uh, through the summer at the least. Uh, that's at Belvedere Plaza. The art exhibition at the bottom of page five. As we know, we still can't all be together in person, but it's one of our most popular events for the season. The virtual art exhibition is available on YouTube. You can click that link right there. It's also as you're making your way through the neighborhood in the windows of various BPCA facilities. So in the windows of um, 75 Battery Place, if you're down uh, at the bottom of the neighborhood, Six River Terrace by, up by Betty, uh, and then the Rockefeller Park House. In the windows, you'll see some of that artwork as well. And again, that's artwork made by participants in our programs. And I, I advise you to see the ad in the brochure as well, but the video is really beautifully done and a, a nice homage to all the folks who put so much care and time into making some beautiful art. Top of page six, really quick. I won't bore you with it because you saw my email blast on that as well. Oculus closures from 1 to 5 a.m. Um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but we just want to make sure folks are aware of that. There are alternate ways in and out. Um, Why are they closing? On various areas. They are know? closing to allow for maintenance uh, and safety of customers due to reduced traffic volumes on the overnight hours. Mm. So it's 1 to 5 each, each, um, each night. And the path is uh, open or not? Oh, it is open. Yeah. The path path is, open. is running. Path is running. There's, there's alternate means of access. Okay. Uh, so we just want to make sure we got that out. We have the information there. Um, you can click on uh, those links for additional information and sign up for W uh, World Trade Center related updates. Okay. Uh, our blood drive we just did again on the 20th. Thanks again. That was our sixth one since June. Uh, the next one we're going to tee up for March 23rd. So no sooner do we uh, 
do we get the gifts of life that we're planning the next one? But it was a great turnout again, given everything that was going on that day, including the inauguration and some other things. Uh, it was a good turnout, and we'll look forward to doing the next one. Over the course of six blood drives so far, we've got about 500 donations, which is, which is really something from this community. Uh, resiliency project updates, page seven. Um, the one thing I wanted to draw attention to now, and again, I thank Tammy and Alice and the team, is we're going, to, we're going to be back to the Environmental Protection Committee on February 22nd. So this month at the EPC Committee, we'll be back with updates on primarily the South Battery Park City Resiliency Project. There's a number of updates uh, we owe the committee uh, and follow-ons from uh, previous conversations we've had. Notably, Justine, this is important for you. As I noted, I think during the full board, the control houses are not part of this. This is a, that's a separate later submission to PDC. So we'll be back to you on the control houses. Once DEP is a little clearer on kind of the timeline for that. The updates okay. will be given to EPC or the other items. You'll follow ups on battery bikeway, uh, battery place, um, PRA Plaza, et cetera. With the resiliency in relation with to resiliency. That. Right. Uh, and, top of page eight. Go ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. Interrupt you. Yep. To your knowledge, those uh, those sheds, those and those fork houses, they need. The they still house. are vital. We need them, right? They have to happen. I mean, yeah. Look, they. I mean, it's okay to just say yes, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, as, far as, as far as I understand, yes, I will say though there are there's conversations going on between city about kind of exactly kind of how how that manifests itself. But yes, you need you need something to house the machinery. That will be closing those vaults to make sure that the, the water doesn't get in. Okay. Um, but again, we, we, we will. Uh, yeah, that's all. I'm glad that you guys, you know, got your opinions on the record for sure. And we'll get that over to make sure that we are, we are pushing to have as much kind of room on the, on the margins as we can to, you know, to try and impact aesthetics and, and design, but more to come on that. Thank you. Um, Top of page eight, really quickly, you guys might have seen this already, but I, I thought it was a nice thing to note in the realm uh, and in the vein of resiliency. Those pictures, that is the northern uh, key of South Cove. So if you're it's right by Miramar, when you first walk down yeah. there. During, this comes back, if you remember Tropical Storm Isaiah, this was back in August. Um, some of the waves kind of came into that corner and really did a number just on that wooden walkway. And you can see, not only was the some of the planks lifted up and damaged, but on the bottom left, and I had to ask my folks to make sure I was seeing this right. That's a metal railing that was shorn apart. Wow, from the yeah, water. From the water. And then the top right, you'll see some of the, the, the granite facing was, was peeled off, was peeled off the side, the side of the cove. Wow. And the reason I put that in is for two reasons. One, to let you know that there's signage up there. We're in the process of repairing it. So you'll see that hopefully reopened again in the spring. No one's hopefully that close to the water in this freezing weather anyway. But the larger point I wanted to make was, because it was a shock to me as well to see it, for what in the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things was mostly a blip on people's radar, like Tropical Storm Isaiah. So yeah, it was a storm, but you don't think of it in the same respect as anything else. That's the damage that storm did wow. to give us a sense of kind of the urgency um, with which we are pursuing resiliency and the ferocity that these storms can wreak, even on kind of lower grade storms. That was not even a, a patch on the arm of some of the things that we are expecting, but dreading, hopefully, that we may yeah. end up getting. So just to give a sense of the damage that Mother Nature is, is going to have her way, um, and we need to do our best to try to prepare uh, and inure ourselves against that. Um, Robin, I'm thinking about you, Port Authority, below grade construction work at Kowski Plaza. I put it in the report last month. The fencing is up. But apparently the work hasn't started yet because they had some contracting issues. That's all my way of saying they, I will make sure that I get some updates about when that work is going to start. Again, it should be mostly below Thank grade. Thank you for thinking of me, Nick. That's and, really something to be remembered for. Well, well <laughs> on relatively low impact, but I wanted to make sure that you'll see the fencing up. The work hasn't started, but I will let you know when it does. The okay. rest of this uh, going quickly is mostly... Uh, not redo, just kind of some stuff we do to keep up there. The virtual programming at the bottom there are page nine, in addition to the art show. Uh, for the seniors, we have uh, Zumba Boogie Madness is up. We have Senior Fitness, Breathe and Bounce, and some children's art programs there. Lucian, you can scroll down to the bottom of page nine. That's all hyperlinked for everyone uh, right there. And then very briefly, I'll make this quick, Justine, sorry. The one thing I did want to draw your attention to, if you scroll down, Lucian, to the bottom of page uh, 11, the First Precinct Community Council, as we know, meets every month. 
I put that little uh, artwork there now. That's from the first precinct, but they are looking nice. for people to participate in the first precinct community council. This day, they're looking to kind of uh, repopulate the board and kind of reinvigorate it. So folks who are interested in participating in police community relation type matters, um, you can certainly reach out uh and and get involved there the next meeting it's all still virtual obviously but uh thursday the 25th at six the zoom link will be made available uh probably a couple of days before that but i want to make sure for folks who are interested that it's on your radar um and they're looking really to to kind of make sure that they're continuing to build those relationships and keeping with some of the things that we had discussed earlier tonight um just a plug so i hope that's helpful think, just a plug i think the artist who did that is liz williams who's been part of the community council oh, yeah. for a very long time. Yeah, uh, Liz, oh, nice. Liz, is, Liz, Liz is acting. I believe she's the acting president at this time, but actively yeah. engaged in trying to get more folks involved. This is Liz, exactly. Liz is great. Yeah. So thank you for that, Robin. That, that's yeah. cool. And Nick, do you go to this? I do. Pat and I go every month. Every month. Interesting. And so anybody can attend. Anyone can attend. Um, you know, when it runs the gamut, you'll get a lot of complaints about um, traffic by the by the uh, the battery tunnel. I'm sorry, it's not the battery mm -hmm. tunnel. By the hollow, the, um, the hollow oh, tunnel, yeah. obviously, um, you get some stuff on homeless. You'll get some, you know, robberies and uh, things in the Soho area. You don't get a lot but, better. Park City, knock on wood, but it doesn't no. mean we're always keeping an eye in there to the ground. Uh, sure. But it's a good. No. And, yeah, it's an ability. It's an. It's an. Uh, it's an opportunity to get some face time with the commanding officer. I mean, he's there every month. He wants to hear from you. There's a new. There's a new commander, uh, Captain Smith now. Um, who is the new commander of uh, the first precinct? He was actually the executive officer there last month because he was on something else. But they're there every month, and it's a nice opportunity to get to meet some of the folks who work in community affairs for the first precinct. No, that's very cool. Yeah, thank you. That's a good plug. All right, question for you. Yes. A little birdie who's not on the phone anymore told me that Ann O'Neill um, is no longer with. Ann. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm so Tell me about Ann. This. Thank you. Uh, Ann O'Neill was our chief horticulturalist. Um, she was wonderful. She had another opportunity uh, and she has uh, moved on from the authority, but I'm, I forgot to put it in my report. It reminds me that, Justine, and we can talk about this as we get closer, but as we come up to the spring, um, it would make sense for us perhaps to have someone talk to the committee about yes. our spring planting plan, maybe for the March meeting. That would be great. Uh, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yes. I so love that. it's gonna. So Bruno, as we know, Bruno Pomponio, who a lot of you know, has been with the authority for for many years. He's forgotten more about the authority than I'll ever learn. But he's <laughs> best. He oversees operations overall. So the folks you see out cleaning the streets and doing everything else is 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 what he oversees. But in addition to all the horticulture and the maintenance and everything else, but with 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 Bruno is Ryan Torres, who a lot of you may know. She's our assistant vice president for parks operations. Uh, and she is uh, she's the individual under whom kind of a lot of horticulture will fall. So what I'm thinking is for next month, we will uh, have one or both of them here to kind of give you uh, just a preview on kind of some of the, the spring plantings, answer any questions. Um, and I had a conversation with, with Tammy on this as well. But, you know, if we want to do something regular where we have conversations about horticulture a couple of times a year with the committee, we can we can talk about making that an item. I think that would be lovely to have them come if they're willing, because especially in, in, in the growing season, you know, uh, yes. it isn't they, they could they could take off the winter, I think, from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, I, I think sense. you've heard of Kathy on that one. Yeah. You, and, you're, and that's OK. We'll have them come in March if that makes sense, because that actually timing wise works out not with the plant, not only with the plantings, but as you know, we usually open us up, up the lawns come in April or so. Yeah. So if the things coming up in advance that we want to tell us, we'd like to hear about it. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah. You had something. Uh, two questions. One is, are you planning to um, replace Anne with the same type of structure that you've just had, or is it going to be some different configuration with staffing responsibilities? No, it'll be this. So there's going to be uh, we're actively looking for someone now, but it'll be. Uh, I'll have. I don't want to speak out of turn because I'm not intimately familiar with it. We'll have Ryan and Bruno kind of talk about the structure, but it will be someone in that in in the in the in the organization that works with Ryan. But it's Ryan oversees essentially a lot of the horticulture operations, uh, and was that was, was with it was that way with Anne as well. So this person I think would be would slot in as part of that overall framework, but I'll have them describe it more in depth when they're here. So you're looking to replace okay. that position, right? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try to we want to get someone back in there as well. To, you know, obviously an important position. 
Okay, and then the second um, suggestion really is when you do find someone, it would be great to do a kind of, um, let's call it an orientation with maybe different stakeholders around aspects of the parks. I remember when Ann, Ann was a great supporter of the community garden and gave a lot of technical yes. assistance. Uh, but when she first came on, some of the impressions she had of the garden and its history and uh, were not the same as the, the gardeners remembered. And it would just be nice to have like iced tea down there and, you know, give our history and perspective on how it's been managed and, you know, round out whatever she's learning or he's learning more formally from the, uh, from the authority. So, yes. Okay. We could do that yes, on our no, own too, but it would be nice if we all coordinated. No, that, that's really helpful. I know Anne was a great supporter of the garden as well, but that's that's also that's all really 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 helpful to hear. You know, Ryan, I had mentioned as well. I should add, you know, we talk a lot about our composting, which is a standing item in report every month, and zero waste, and a lot of the things we're doing with sustainability. And Ryan has a lot of that in her belly as well. So um, this person will be working closely with that, and that's a good suggestion, Kathleen. We'll have we'll have them reach out. Thanks. I'm sure you remember it from your early days too. <laughs> I mean, you get all yeah. these perspectives from different parts of the community. No, so. it's okay. I mean, that's that's why we're here. We want to. We're not going to be able to do everything, obviously, but we certainly want to hear. Uh, there are some really useful bits that come from the community. We were just taking off the last week, I think, with someone else. But you know, life rings, even small things like that, like like life rings and, and, and different things that we can work in the community with is uh, is welcome. The hanging baskets that we did—that was really a really nice, fun thing we did uh, that Ann Schwabenberg had come up with. So for sure, there are some real things that are of value that come from the people who live here. Yeah, it's nice. Okay, I'm sure able to implement them. I'm not sure if Mariama has her hand raised or Kathy, were you finished? I'm finished. Okay. I don't know if she's raised or not raised, but um, I'm sorry, no, I'm not raised. Not raised. Okay, thanks, Mariama. Just making sure. All right. Well, I think we might be done. Are you done, Nick? I'm done. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you so much. No. And we'll, uh, we'll be in you. touch as we always are. Yes, I appreciate it. And thank you. And yeah, this has been great. I think I can call this meeting to a close. Do I have a second or do I have to do the seconds? Whatever the rules are, Mr. Lucian, somebody second. second. I'll second. I second. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for this meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time and effort. Thanks, thank everyone. Okay. See you next month. See you next month. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks, Lucian. Thanks, Justine. Bye, everyone.